frog in my throat there. All right, guys, welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode here of Extreme Health Radio. Super excited you are here. This is really cool. Uh, this is sort of a special episode. Um, we wanted to get JB on the show because uh, he's got a really great book that he has written called How to End the Autism Epidemic. And this is going to be an awesome show. Um, and I heard, and he told us a while back that he's going on a little bit of a media break for a while. And we're booked up for a couple months in advance, so I wanted to make sure to you know have him on the show. So this is a special uh, Thursday episode of the show. So super excited you're here. We're going to talk about his book. Um, this is going to be really, really fun. So I appreciate it. This is episode 631. And if you're new to the show, new to what we do, uh, we broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. This is a special Thursday show. Um, so we broadcast live Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 1045 a.m. Pacific time. And uh, that way you can join the live show, ask your questions. And it's a unique kind of experience because there's not a lot of um, opportunity out there to ask some of our questions. Our, uh, our guests questions um, about your health issues. So this is going to be a cool show. Uh, make sure to share this show with your friend or tag a friend if you're watching on Facebook or if you're watching on YouTube. Make sure to share this if you have a Facebook group or anything like that because uh, this is going to be a really, really good show. I'm really excited to have him on. Um, before we introduce him, though, let me just share with you some of our upcoming shows. Speaking of doing our shows live, and um, so this is a special Thursday show episode uh, 631. And if you want to grab the show notes for the sponsors or anything else we talk about, uh, it is extremehealthradio.com slash 631. And so on our uh, homepage here of Extreme Health Radio. We've got, uh, obviously, J.B. Hanley today, the end of autism. And then tomorrow, Friday, November 16th, we're going to talk to Angel Howerton. Howerton. <laughs> I can say her name. Uh, she had stage four, I should say, her body had stage four uh, uterine cancer, and she was able to overcome it naturally. And this is pretty awesome story. So um, really, really encouraging story. And then on Monday, we have a special Double header. We've got Dr. Len Saputo, uh, medical doctor. We'll let him on the show, even though he's a medical doctor. He's going to be talking about light and how light affects our health and what we can do to work with light to improve our health. And then the drugless doctor, Dr. Bob DeMaria, and we'll be talking with him. It looks like he has here a healthy look at sex and romance. That's kind of cool. Uh, then on Wednesday, we're going to have next Wednesday, November 21st, a few days before Thanksgiving, we're going to have Kayla Daniel, Dirty Little Secrets of the Detox Industry. So if you haven't subscribed to our show, uh, whether you're listening on I, you know, Apple, iTunes, whatever else, Stitcher, um, you know, Facebook, YouTube, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of these shows. And um, subscribe to our newsletter as well, and uh, you'll get updates on all the shows that we have going on and all the upcoming shows, all the past shows, all that good stuff. So, all right. So today's show, episode 631, is something that I'm really excited about because we have brand new, as most of you guys know, um, four, gosh, are they five months old now? <laughs> They're born uh, June 27th. So um, four months old twins and uh, um, vaccines is a big, big issue coming up in our family. And most of you listeners probably know our position on vaccines. And so um, this is one of the reasons why we wanted to have JB on the show. And for those of you that don't know who he is, he's been all over the media. He's been in Vaxxed. He's been on The Doctor. He's been on, gosh, Jenny McCarthy's show, One Radio Network. He's been on everything. Uh, he's the father of a, of a child with autism. And he and his wife co-founded uh, Gener Generation Rescue, which is a national autism uh, charity in 2005. And he spent his career in private equity industry, uh, but he received his undergraduate degrees with honors from Stanford. Um, but now he's working on this bringing enlightenment to this autism thing. And let me show you his book right here that I have. This is really fascinating. It's called how to end the autism epidemic. And let me just read with you before I bring him on. This is crazy. So he's on the back of the book. He's got this chart, right? You can probably see that. Can you see that? Yeah, you can see that. Okay. So this is the autism rates. Um, in 1970, it says here, it was one in 10,000. Uh, 1985, I was born in 75. So it was roughly one in 10,000. Uh, 1985, it was one in 2,500. Uh, 1995, it was one in 500. 2001, one in 250. And it just keeps going up. You can see the bell curve here, or the curve up here. It's one in 2012, one in 68. In 2018, this is the year we're in now, one in 36. And the projections are just going through the roof. So let me bring him on coming all the way from Florida. I'm sorry, not from Florida, from Oregon. How you doing, JB? Doing great. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. 
I'm super, super glad that we, um, that we got you on. And um, you mentioned to me that you're going on a little bit of a media break. <laughs> yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a couple months since my book was released. Uh, I'm shocked. You know, it, it, you can see on Amazon your rank every day of the book. And, and I got about as high as number 40 um, on all of Amazon, which was well beyond any expectation. Um, it's still in the 300s right now. Um, and so it sort of exceeded all possible expectations for sales. And, um, you know, two months in promoting a book, saying the same thing over and over again, I just thought that uh, I think people were getting sick of hearing from me. So I thought I'd take a little break. <laughs> well, you got the holidays coming up and uh, it's a great time of year, right? <laughs> Other things to do. I'm the father of three children, so uh, including one who has autism. So uh, I got other priorities. So yeah. the book, the book in many ways is like a, um, it's like a summary of my activism career, if you will. It's not a career. Obviously, I don't make any money from it. But, you know, I've been an, I've been a public activist since 2005. Um, and honestly, um, I already know all this stuff. My family's fine and protected. And um, at this point, I'm only doing it to try to share the information with other parents. And um, there's nothing more comprehensive or complete that I can do than this book. And so I feel like if somebody really wants to know what's going on, if they make it from the first page to the last page of my book, they will have an entirely, uh, you know, new and comprehensive view of the world and kind of what's going on. So it feels mm -hmm. like a great ending point for me in certain ways. Oh, yeah, definitely. Are you still doing private equity? Um, I, I am on a personal level, yeah. I've been very um, lucky to have a, a productive career. And um, I co-ran a firm for a long time that I retired from three or four years ago. And I continue to dabble in the business world, which honestly is my passion. That's what I actually enjoy and, you know, find interesting and am trained in and, and everything else. And um, I think like, like most parent activists who are involved in the autism fight, uh, we really got dragged into this against our will. If you, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't, I don't, I don't really want to be here. I really don't want to be here. And we, I joke with a lot of parents. I know, you know, many of the more active parents in the autism community, we're all, we're all friends. We're all friendly. And I always say like, I wish I'd never met you because I really do. I wish I had had the wisdom that could have left me in my happy little mainstream bubble um, rather than having the veils just absolutely ripped right off my eyes and being thrown into this horrible rabbit hole of mistrust and cynicism and, and everything else that's going on right now. I mean, mm -hmm. it's yeah. just being honest. I wish I kind of wish I just had my little idyllic, you know, blinders on. Um, mm -hmm. It's been, you know, it's been a real change in my life that my wife and I could have like never expected would happen to us. And yet I think what, what happens as a parent is first of all, I, you know, I watched my own son decline into autism. And so that's about as, um, you know, intense and experiences you can go through. And then in a, in a quest simply to get him better, which I think any parent would go on a similar quest. Um, the things I learned were just outrageous. And, and I think that that outrage has fueled, you know, my choice to be a public voice on a, what is a controversial topic. Um, there's a big difference between controversy and facts, but it's a mm. controversial topic for the moment. But but it's, you know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to commend you for putting yourself out there because, man, this topic is such a hot button topic. It's so, it's just so volatile. People talking and people, you know, if you do a search on your name and, you know, all these all these articles come up trying to discredit you and telling, you know, t you know, saying how everything you're saying is wrong and, you know, just all these allegations against you. And it's just, man, it's just like it doesn't sound like yeah. any fun to be a part of that, does it? <laughs> well. You know, um, I, I, I use the analogy in my book of like what happened with tobacco, right? And um, it took 40 years from the first clear biological evidence that, you know, painting tobacco tar on a mouse caused the mice to have cancer. You know what I mean? Um, when Rachel Carson uh, published her book, Silent Spring, that exposed what DDT was doing to environments, uh, the chemical industry funded an, an extreme, you know, character assassination against Rachel Carson, you know. Um, and so I recognize that anybody who who has a credible voice is going to be a perceived as a threat. And, you know, if you if you look at the people who, you know, quote unquote, attack me or whatever, 
they can almost always be traced back to the mainstream medical community or pharmaceutical industry in some way. And, um, you know, I, I wrote, I wrote the book and, and I think anybody who's on the fence about, you know, credibility or information, just read the book, you know, just read the book. And I think that that clears up a lot of the noise out there. Um, it's, it's, it's extremely well referenced and, um, you know, for those who haven't read the book, it's, it's really not a memoir. You know, I think some people think, well, if a dad's writing a book about autism, it's probably just going to be a personal story. Mm. The personal story in that book is maybe five or six pages. And then the rest is clear, documented evidence of what's happened to a generation of children. And I think it's really important to frame things in the proper way. Um, there was an article in the New York Times many years ago where the headline was parents versus the science, right? And that's a, that's a narrative meant to trivialize parental complaints about vaccines causing autism, right? Parents versus the science implies the parents are wrong and emotional, but that's not actually what's going on. We have thousands of doctors, hundreds of scientists, and then tens of thousands of parents all saying the same thing. And I think that um, the book is more like a documentary of all yeah there you go parents versus research yeah, you're yeah. Right, research yeah, yeah that's that actually it? what i'm talking about okay and, uh yeah by the way gardner harris i just have to say this man this is i, mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't think anybody but um i've had a lot of interactions with that guy he's a new york times reporter and he's always been very pro-vaccine and um i read that he had to leave um his post in india he was assigned to india for the new york times recently oh, because wow. his son his son's asthma was so severe and um, I don't wish asthma on any child. I don't find anything funny about having to leave a country because your son's asthma is so severe. Um, but what is true is that, you know, a study that nobody's ever heard of in 2000 out of UCLA showed a strong connection between the DTP vaccine and asthma. In fact, the, the study authors went so far as to say, um, if it weren't for the DTP vaccine, it's safe to say that, that half as many children or less would have asthma today. So like this clear link between autoimmunity and, and this reporter who wrote that article who I've personally corresponded with written critical articles about actually has a son with asthma so severe that he had to leave like, you know, that's crazy. Right. Yeah, it is. And that's, it, yeah. Again, I want to be really clear. I'm not, you know, a child with asthma is a serious thing. I don't mean to make light of it any way. I just found it ironic because I think it's plausible if not likely mm -hmm. um, that the cause of his son's asthma is actually well documented by the science. And here he is, one of the most ardently pro-vaccine journalists out there who, you know, pens these articles that try to misframe the debate. And so, again, to get back to my book and, you know, what I think is compelling about it is the, the group of scientists and the group of doctors who are growing in their um, in how loud they're willing to be and the platform that they're utilizing and the, the volume of their published science. It's all on the rise. And um, I always say in these interviews, they should all be standing right behind me because I didn't do any of the science. I didn't, you know, publish any of it. All I'm doing is interpreting it to lay people. And I just think that um, because it's so hard to get that message out in the mainstream media, that if somebody simply steps back and tries to put aside their preconceived notions and they read the book and they read the science for themselves, I just feel that they have to at least come away saying there's something there's something going on here. There's yeah. something wrong here. Yeah, there's got to be something happening. There's got to be some correlation. So when you said they're on the rise, do you mean that the ability for them to put out more information is on the rise or they're doing more th more studies and those yeah. are on the rise to try to discredit people like you and me? No, no, no. So what I mean is the... So y you know this, but for your audience, you have epidemiology and you have biology. So you have epidemiological science and you have biological science. Very different, right? Epidemiology, mm -hmm. running numbers on spreadsheets, comparing outcomes. Um, that's what the CDC has done to try to refute the vaccine autism connection. And as I explain in my book, they've done so in just a little tiny portion of the vaccine schedule, right? They've only looked at um, the MMR vaccine and they've only looked at the ingredient thimerosal. So that leaves 10 vaccines that have never been studied and more than four dozen ingredients that have never been studied for their relationship to autism. And yet, even with that very, very, very limited scale of what they've actually looked at, the mainstream tries to say, this has been asked and answered. This has been asked and answered. There's no reason to look at this anymore. We've studied this issue. There's millions of children we've looked at. They have all these very, very 
bold statements which are 100 percent unsupportable by the facts and i do break this down in my book very clearly so there's your epidemiology over there and most of that was done in the 2000s um, on the other side you have biological science and that's where you take a vaccine or a vaccine ingredient and you actually inject it into an animal and i know that, that may bum some people out and i get it i'm not saying that i support animal studies but in this case um, the outcomes of these studies have been very very revealing all that science has only started happening since about 2005, and it's really picked up steam since about 2010. It's almost exclusively published in other countries, countries other than the United States. And when you when you take all those published studies and you put them together, which I do in my book, um, it's pretty easy to start to draw some clear conclusions that that we can show with conviction that vaccines are triggering the very types of neuroinflammation that we're finding in people with autism. Right, so. I'll give you a simple example. Um, we know that um, IL-6 is a biomarker for autism. IL-6 is a cytokine. A cytokine is something released by the immune system during times of infection or inflammation. Okay. And the brain has its own immune system, and it will release cytokines to fight various infections. Well, we know with certainty that people with autism have much higher levels of IL-6 in their brains. And now we know that if you inject a vaccine into an animal, the IL-6 in their brains goes up, right? So these are you know, sort of cause and effect, deductive reasoning kinds of relationships. And, you know, one of the things about science is that it might take 10 studies to tell the story completely, right? Not any one of them is definitive by itself because they're each doing very specific things. Like one study might find that IL-6 goes up. Another study might find that a vaccine causes socialization in mice to go down. And so you take all these studies and you put them together and you ask, is this creating a clearer picture? And indeed, it, it really, really is. And so that's one of my main arguments in the book is that we've got this. Um, yeah, there you go. Hey, that's so good. Yeah. So this is a um, this is a wonderful um, website. It's called Vaccine Papers, the one that you guys have put up here. Uh -huh. um, it's created by a scientist, not myself, but by a scientist. And I think it does a fantastic job for a more science oriented person yeah. of looking through all the different studies that are starting to demonstrate the things that I'm talking about. And this is the um, this is the conversation that's missing from the mainstream, but that any objective scientist, uh, when they when they actually start to look into the details, they have like a revelation, right? Like, Jesus, there really is something to all this. And, mm -hmm. you know, most most even well-meaning doctors and well-meaning scientists don't realize that the only vaccine studied for its relationship to autism is the MMR. They just don't know that. They think mm -hmm. the whole schedule that they looked at. And um, there's this uh, there's this meta analysis that was done by um, a guy named Taylor out of Australia. It's a meta analysis, right? So you know what that is. A meta analysis mm -hmm. is a study that looks at a bunch of other studies, right? And um, the head of the National Institute of Mental Health, the current head of the National Institute of Mental Health, he was approached by a number of people from our community who said basically, look, this is not a resolved topic. We have this massive spike in autism that continues. We have hundreds of thousands of parents all saying the same thing. We have growing science proving that what we're saying is true. Mm -hmm. You're now the new head appointed by President Trump of the National Institutes of Mental Health how do you defend not taking a closer look at the vaccine autism relationship? And he said, well, I think the science is settled on this topic. And they said, well, oh. what, you know, what science, what's your, what's your evidence? To, why would you make a statement like that? Right. And he said, I will get back to you. I'll get back to you. Okay, great. Okay. So <laughs> we go by and he literally in an email that I expose in my book, um, he sends a single link. The link is to the Taylor study, the meta analysis from Australia Okay. Well, anybody with brain, if you go into the meta-analysis, it looks at thimerosal, it looks at MMR, and it doesn't look at anything else. Interesting. You, you can't say, <laughs> you can't say that they've studied this issue in any comprehensive manner. Um, there's a deposition going around, which I quote in my book as well, by from a guy named Stanley Plotkin, and there's a there's a part of that deposition that really, for me, was super intriguing, where. The lawyer is just pounding this guy. Stanley Plotkin's arguably the godfather of the entire vaccine industry. What's his name again? He, Stanley Plotkin, P-L-O-T-K-I-N. Yeah, yeah. Stanley. Um, yeah, yeah. And and his deposition is making its way around Facebook right now. I've seen, um, but it's in my book. And um, this is Paul Offit's mentor. This is literally the guy who taught you know Paul Offit everything he knows and uh -huh. shared 
royalties with Dr. Offit on the rotavirus vaccine. And, you know, there was a survey done of the most influential people in the vaccine industry. He was number two behind Bill Gates. So this is like a big guy. Yes. Yeah, wow. Plotkin, that's it. Wow. And um, Plotkin in my book, um, he's being deposed. He's serving as an expert witness in a mom, dad case. God, there, there he is. Mm. Uh, he's being deposed in a, in a mother, father case over whether or not to vaccinate a child. This is just back in January. And um, the lawyer who's extremely well prepared is pushing Plotkin on the on the vaccine autism thing. And he keeps asking him, you know, has DTP ever been studied for its relationship to autism or DTAP rather? Okay. You know, DTAP first vaccines that babies receive. It's a serious vaccine. I hear a lot of reports about children regressing after it. Mm -hmm. Plotkin finally concedes no. They have never looked at DTAP for its relationship to autism. And then the lawyer says, but you would still say to a parent that vaccines don't cause autism. He says, yes, absolutely. Th that's I mean, that's the leap that these people are making because they just want to protect an ideology, not because they want to be honest about the science. And so I think that I've, I've, I've obviously had a lot of people who I know read my book and I've had some of my friends who, you know, I have Stanford buddies who've gone on to be physicians and, you know, relatively accomplished physicians in a number of places. And this has been a, not a debate, but a conversation between us for a long time. Once I saw what happened to my son and it's kind of funny. You know, one of my good buddies is a pediatric cardiologist. One of my good buddies is a neurologist. Uh -huh. And you know, because they knew me in advance, they've listened, right? They're like, <laughs> he's not crazy. We know this guy. We were in the same fraternity in, at Stanford together. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, several of them, to their credit, have read my book, right? And what they say is, holy shit, right? I didn't know any of this. <laughs> this is published in pediatrics. They don't tell me about this. I didn't realize how limited the studies they'd done really were. I had no idea there was all this biological evidence, which is pretty compelling and pretty interesting. And, uh -huh. you know, it's gotten, it's gotten to the point, nobody knows this. I mean, I say it in my book, but no one knows it in like, you know, the broader world. The, the evidence for aluminum specifically causing material issues in the brains of these animal studies, which obviously I, I'm willing to extrapolate that if you scramble the brains of a mouse or a monkey, I'm not putting that in my baby. That's just my own personal standards, right? Right, right, right. right. The brains, <laughs> I'm not going to take that risk. By the way, there's a new, have you seen the new sheep study out of Spain? No, what they is vaccinated, it? They vaccinated these sheep. You can Google like sheep study Spain aluminum vaccines. I'm sure it will come up. It is so disturbing. So they vaccinate the sheep with like sheep vaccines because animals are getting sick like crazy from vaccines for anybody who doesn't know this. In the veterinary, veterinarian community, there is a huge and much more open debate about the, the harm of vaccinations. One of the grossest new studies that I just saw. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, I mean, it's... What, which the, one would this the, be, do you know? Um, Maybe... Well, so the first two you have there are, are articles about the study itself. Okay. And so you could probably to the study. Like the Ghost Ship Media article is actually a really good one. That's Celeste McGovern. She's an excellent journalist, and she writes all about the study. Um, and so... Yeah, and there, she writes. She actually has two articles on this. If you see the recent post over there, vaccines induce bizarre antisocial behavior. That one's even more interesting. So not only did they find that the aluminum ended up in the lymph nodes of the sheep everywhere in their body, but wow. they they started like biting each other and and doing all these yeah wool biting, restlessness, anxious behavior. So wow. you know, I, I kind of make the point like, if this stuff is happening in animals, I'm not you know I'm probably not going to give want to give that to my baby. No and and the the point I was trying to make is that. Um, People don't know this, right? People don't know any of this science because the mainstream media doesn't report it because it obviously would scare parents. Oh, yeah. Um, about the scene schedule. Um, the three of the most important scientists on this topic are um, Christopher Shaw out of the University of uh, British Columbia, Romain Girardi um, out of the University of Paris, and, and Chris Exley from Keele University, right? So that's a Canadian a Frenchman and a Brit. Okay. Um, they've done some of the most groundbreaking work in this area on aluminum um, from vaccines. And I want to be clear, aluminum from vaccines and ionic aluminum are totally different. Aluminum right. from vaccine, aluminum hydroxide, it's a nanoparticulized man-made form of aluminum whose potency and effect on the body is very, very different. So the only way to know what it does is to use it, right? To actually use the aluminum adjuvant itself. Exactly, yeah. They've done... They've done these studies. They were so shaken by the findings from these studies, which Shaw was the literally the pioneer, right? So like 07 was the first time anybody had injected aluminum into an animal. 
That was literally the first time that the aluminum adrenaline for vaccines was injected into an animal was 2007 by Christopher Shaw. Wow. They were shaken by, they were so shaken by what they found that those three scientists, each independent of each other, wrote a letter to the American Public Health Service in late 2017, basically saying, here's my bibliography of published studies. Okay. I'm deeply concerned about the aluminum being injected into infants. Mm -hmm. I'm deeply concerned about the statements that the CDC and the FDA are making saying that aluminum has been deemed safe at the levels used in vaccines because the way they came about that was really, really, really incorrect. And I can go into that. And we also, you know, this is the scientist speaking, the, the idea that vaccines don't cause autism, at, at, re, at least as it relates to aluminum, we don't believe is true. And we'd ask you to please consider changing that. Mm -hmm. I, People don't appreciate how extraordinary that is that tenured scientists from mainstream universities in other countries are writing letters that they're signing to our public health ser health service. Um, That's and yet massive. they are. You, you can find, I believe the letters are up on my blog. So on JB Henley blog, there's an international scientists um, article. It's like international scientists found the cause of autism. It's a super long article, but if you go to the very end, yeah, if you go to the very end, so yeah, go down to the one that has like a map. Keep going, yeah, keep going. Yeah, right there. Okay. So click on that one from April 2nd. Okay. And then it's a really long article, but at the very end, I'm pretty sure I put their uh, letters up. It's at the, yeah, it's like at the, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah so yeah. There, there they are. So like, you know, I don't know what the date on that is, but like, you know, there it is. There's a letter. So that's mid-2017. I said late. It should have been mid. Okay. Uh I mean, so Chris Shaw is, you know, a tenured professor at the University of British Columbia. Um, he He's showing, you know, there he says it, in regard to the, oh, just missed it. Yeah, so oh, there he's saying, like, yeah, so he, what's he saying? He's saying, in regard to the above, it's my belief that the CDC's claim on its website that vaccines do not cause autism is wholly unsupported. Wow. I mean, this is, this is stunning that these things exist and, and nobody knows these. It's just stunning. And so... What you'll find, and this is always the case, is that so, you know, Shaw, Girardi, mm -hmm. and Exley, they could have been the world's most mainstream and respected scientists, and, and they were, mm -hmm. but now they're quacks, right? Now they're quacks, right? The minute right. these letters are written, I'm sure, and I haven't, but I'm sure if you Googled, you'd find reasons why these guys are out to lunch or whatever. But there it is again, the CDC's claim that vaccines don't cause autism is unsupported with respect to aluminum adjuvants, and this claim stifles the important research to determine the safety of aluminum adjuvants use of vaccine. See, this is what's so frustrating for me. You know, um, I, I consider myself a very kind of boring, what are the facts kind of person, like I'm not into hyperbole. and um, <laughs> Right, right. I, you know, my, my background is finance, right? I look at numbers. I'm used to people inflating, you know, how good their business is doing. And it's my job to kind of distill down what's really going on. What's well, actually happening. Yeah. 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 And that's how I made my money. I mean, I just, you know, and I'm, I'm very, very comfortable with numbers and running spreadsheets and looking at details, right? That's my, that's my work. That's my life's work is to look at the details and run the numbers. And you start to see the science that these guys are producing. You start to see the kind of letters they're writing. And then you think about some of the vitriol you're hearing that, um, you know, we're crackpots and this has been disproven and this is just a myth. And it's just amazing. It's just amazing. And, and again, objective, science-based people who read my book or look at Girardi's work or look at Shaw's work um, or look at Exley's work, they're often literally thrown into a state of cognitive dissonance trying to reconcile what they've been hearing publicly and then what the details really say. I've mm -hmm. had this experience so many times with well-meaning people who've decided, you know, JB, you're like a pretty normal guy, yet you kind of have this passionate view about something that, you know, people say you must be like, crazy or a profiteer or, you know, right. whatever it might be, just take a look at the details, you know, and, and then they do. And they're like, I can't even believe what they say publicly versus That's, what's uh, actually true. And yeah, I, I just want to remind you that um, tobacco was literally the same story. They, so after the 1953 study where, um, uh, and I talk about this in my book where they painted, they painted tobacco tar on mice and then they developed cancer skin cancer, right? After that 1953 study, um, the tobacco companies knew they had a really, really serious problem on their hands. People were dying from their product. It was clearly carcinogenic. 
And so they developed the Tobacco Science Research Committee, right? They, they got physicians at all the major universities in America, Harvard, Yale, to do studies that muddied the waters. They used epidemiology. They blamed, you know, the lung cancer on other parts of people's lifestyles or a unique gene thing or here's 20 ways it's not happening. Um, they created doubt. Doubt is the doubt is the currency to keep well-meaning people on the sidelines. And I can't mm. tell you how many well-meaning people I've had conversations with. And they go, well, gosh, I mean, is autism even really on the rise? Because there's been doubt sowed about that very simple issue of prevalence. Right, right. They, well, I mean, they've looked at that so many times, right? That's like beating a dead horse, right? Of Millions course. Millions of kids have that, right? Isn't it genes? Don't they have gene studies that prove that? Mm -hmm. And if you get somebody to actually engage, they realize that on all of those points, there's nothing there. There's no substance. And this, this is, I, this is a common playbook. And, you know, one of my, the rhetorical question that I've been getting people on lately, uh -huh. it just, I get kind of, it gets, it kind of brings people down to the cynical level where they need to be on this topic. Uh -huh. How many times in the history of mankind has there been a product for which people, a group of people made a profit from that product? And for which another group of people loudly were claiming injury. Okay? Uh -huh. How many times in the history of mankind, when you've had this kind of conflict, which we have all the time, mm -hmm. have the profiteers turned out to be telling the truth? Okay. And so lead in paint, lead in gasoline, Viox, DDT, you know, many different brain drugs. Now we're learning statins. Mm -hmm. um, and about 5 billion other examples. Right. Opioid. Things that poisoned or injured humans. And the profiteers fought it. Glyphosate. And the profiteers fought it and said, there are nothing to these claims. Here's our science. It's pure. Everything's good. I don't know why these people are saying this. How many times did the profiteers end up being right? That there was no problem. The answer is zero. The answer is zero in the history of mankind. And so we're <laughs> right. being asked if this is going to be that first time. Yeah. Yeah. This is fascinating stuff. I hope you guys are enjoying the show with uh, JB Hanley right now. We're going to take a quick little break. Wow. What do you guys think? Um, very, very fascinating stuff. If you have any questions, those of you that are in the chat rooms, on, gosh, where are they, YouTube and Facebook, um, make sure to type them in all caps. And I think what we can do is after we come back from the break, we can take a couple questions for JB um, after the break. And um, so recently, many of you guys know that, that um, listen to the show, uh, know that we had a building biologist come over to our home recently. Uh, he was on our show recently, and um, we had him out here down in Southern California. And he's a building biologist, an amazing guy, Brian Hoyer. And he does a lot of work with uh, EMF mitigation, dirty electricity uh, mitigation, um, the cell towers and the 5G, and all this crazy stuff. And uh, he came out and did a home assessment. And you can actually hire him to come out to your house and uh, you know, do a full assessment. So he's got like $30,000 worth of equipment and he'll come and he'll test your walls. We have a ton of YouTube videos that we're gonna be releasing here pretty soon about all of this stuff. But one of the things he tests for is uh, dirty electricity. Uh, and this exists in all of our walls in our homes. And anytime you have an electrical field running across a, a wire in your home, um, you're gonna have a corresponding magnetic field as well. So you have now you have electrical field and a magnetic field and we're using um, uh, AC alternating current, we should be using DC direct current, but for some reason we went to the 60 Hertz DC, um, AC and it's really screwing up our health. There's been a lot of studies showing, um, the connection between, um, you know, blood sugar, insulin, diabetes, um, all kinds of things with uh, dirty electricity in these fields. And I think that one of the biggest things that's happening in our culture, um, environmentally, um, is happening right now with the rollout of 5G. So it's going to become more and more clear uh, that we need to mitigate our homes. We need to protect our homes. I was talking to JP or JB before the show, and I just wanted to make sure he wasn't on a wireless connection. He he kind of said, "Of course not. I wouldn't be on a wireless wireless connection." And so it's really important. So 
The cool thing is that in today's world, we have mitigation strategies. So with all the problems we have in today's world, there's a, there, there are solutions. And one of the solutions is are these green wave filters. And what they do essentially is they knock back all of the non-native dirty electricity running through your walls. And so if you have like your bedroom or where your kids sleep, you can plug these into your wall and um, you can get a little meter here and test. And, um, and they have a little plug here on the bottom of it so that you can uh, you know, still have three or two plugs in, um, in your wall. You're not gonna lose an outlet there. Um, and they have three prongs and two prongs. I think you could, if I bring it up here um, and you can see that you can plug these into all areas of your house and they have whole house systems. And it's just so important guys to make sure to mitigate electricity. A lot of people asking us like how, you know, how do I get healthy? What things can I do? And I, I, I really think that it's, it's really is about light water and magnetism and EMF and protecting yourself from these things. And, um, so it's critical guys to make sure to mitigate the areas of your home where you spend the most time. Um, and this is why we're a big fan of the green wave, um, EMF filters, and we're going to get them on the show. We're going to talk to them about what their technology does, and it's going to be a good show. So um, if you guys want to grab those, are they offering a discount? I don't think so, no. Um, but they're available in our store, and if you guys are interested in mitigating these you know, parts of your home that could be causing problems for you, um, I highly recommend getting some of these for you know the areas of your home you spend the most time. Um, and then one of the other things that we really love is, you can probably tell I'm, I'm f kind of focusing on you know, the bedroom here with these kind of commercials, but um, we're really a big fan of these Magnetico mag magnetic sleep pads. And, you know, magnetism over the years um, has been decreasing on the earth. And, um, you know, Robert O. Becker, uh, who was an oral surgeon back in the 60s, uh, he used magnetism and electrical stimulation, positive negative uh, feedback in the 60s to regrow the limbs of uh, salamander, which is crazy, right? So, Magnetism is really, really important, and for some reason, we're losing it in our, uh, you know, on the Earth. Um, and some have said that the magnetic field is weakened over eighty percent in the last four thousand years, which is crazy. Um, and you know, back back during the Babylonian Empire, they said that the magnetic field of the Earth was three to five Gauss. Now it's less than 0.5. Um, and so all of these things are decreasing, and um, magnetism is critical for our health. And you can see a picture here of Kate sitting on ours when she was pregnant. Look at that. She was pregnant with uh, twins, our twin boys there. She's about, gosh, seven, eight months along there. Um, and that's our Magnetico that we have. And so we are going to be upgrading to the Super Sleep system, which is a 20 gauss system. Um, ours is a 10 gauss and our kids are sleeping like crazy. Um, sleeping so great 12 hours a night our kids are sleeping it's unbelievable um, and then there's a little quote here I liked from Nikola Tesla he says uh, if you want to find the secrets of the universe think in terms of energy frequency and vibration and ultimately we are magnetic frequency beings light beings repositories of light um, and this is what it's all about so if you use a code EHR10 that will give you 10% off your order if you guys want to check out the Magnetico mattress pad. So let me pop on over to the chat here really quickly and see if you guys have any questions for JB. And um, let me make sure that my mic is on. Yeah, my mic is on, good. Um, okay, so let's start with this one. I've got an interesting question. Let me bring JB back up here. Got a question from the chat room, JB, and uh, ZZ Cap, buying... what's that? I'm busy buying the <laughs> Medico mat. That looks awesome. Oh, it's <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah. Oh, it's a great, it's a great, ours is a 10 gauss and, uh, and we're going to get the 20 gauss here pretty soon. It's awesome. All right. I'm going to try it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So we got, let's see, uh, G, let's see. ZZ captain says, Okay, well, this is kind of a solution-based question he's got for you. Um, what is the best ways to rid ourselves of all of this excess aluminum? Do you have any thoughts on that kind of thing? Yeah, I do. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to rely on what Chris actually says because he's the preeminent neurotoxicologist in the world on aluminum, and he's actually run studies where they look at using various chelators, and then they analyze urine and other things to see what comes out of the body, right? And Aluminum is complex to bring out of the body because it's very hard to bring out by itself. In nature, aluminum binds with silica, 
And, and so um, silicon aluminum, when they see each other in the body, they, they get together and then they're much easier to transport out of the body. Ah. He recommend he actually claims, and I'm just, people, people get all fired up to want to use all their own different solutions about this. So I'm just going to say, actually claims that the number one way to get aluminum out of your brain is to drink a liter and a half of Fiji water in an hour or less. Okay. And the reason he names the Fiji water um, by brand is because in the United States, they have the highest bioavailable silica as in naturally occurring from the water of any mineral water that's available in the United States. There's another brand whose name escapes me right now that's in Europe. So, um, you know, I have nothing for or against Fiji water. I, I kind of don't like buying a bunch of Fiji water because it all comes in plastic bottles. But right. I, I actually I have four cases of Fiji water delivered to my house every week ever since I heard that from actually because I figured well, what's the downside? You know, what's right. the down <laughs> plastic? And I don't feel good about that. But if it gets the aluminum out of my son's brain and frankly out of my own brain, why not? And um, Chris Exley, you know, there's headlines in European newspapers about Exley discovering the link between aluminum and Alzheimer's. Um, and then the link, obviously, between aluminum and autism. So his answer is the answer I go with 1.5 liters of Fiji water within an hour, once a day should bring your aluminum levels down. And I do think that there are other ways to get aluminum into the body. Um, and even ionic aluminum, if it ends up in your brain, is bad for you. Aluminum hydroxide from a vaccine seems to be particularly toxic to you. And, you know, regular drinking. And, you know, there are actually, um, yeah, there you go, right? So MS, you know, he has a number of things that he points to where he thinks that aluminum is a primary driver hmm. because of what it does. And, and actually actually looks in the brains of people who have passed away who have these various conditions and he measures their aluminum levels. So he has a massive database of aluminum levels in brain tissue. Um, he had a recent one, aluminum levels of brain tissue and autism, where he didn't just find that the levels were high. He found that the location of the aluminum in the brains of people with autism was really unique. It was from their immune system, which means that it got brought there from somewhere else, which kind of, it all ties together. And I explain this in my book in, in great detail. So to answer the question, the Fiji water route is the only route I know of that's been scientifically studied that gets aluminum out of your brain. Wow, that is fascinating. I never thought a, like a Fiji water, because I'm with you on the plastic thing, but wow, that's crazy. I mean, you, you guys can Google it, you can study it. You can, and, and so people will say to me, well, you know, I'll just use these silica drops. Uh, I have homeopathic silica. You know, I can get silica through these different foods. And I'm like, you know, great. I mean, give it a shot. Exley has been asked those questions. He's the expert. I'm not. And what he says is, look, we've we've tried a bunch of different things. And what we basically do is we give them to people and then we measure the aluminum levels in their urine before and after. Right. That's like a kind of basic way to know if you're expelling this stuff. And he says the only thing that works is bioavailable silica from mineral water. So he will argue that point strongly. There you go. So. You know, wow. they literally did it right here, right? They they gave these people, you know, and so look, I'm I'm everything in my book that's a statement is cited. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so yeah. oh, I'm a slave to the science for better or worse. I I don't doubt that there are other natural remedies to get aluminum out of the brain that people will innovate and create. I'm an enormous fan of the natural health community. Um, I try things like biomats and whatever all the time. If I don't think they're going to hurt me and they might help me, I'm completely open to that stuff. But I also like to see what's actually published and proven. And so I can say with conviction that I give my entire family lots of Fiji water, hoping it's taking the aluminum out of their brains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good stuff. So I was reading on the back of your book, The Autism Rates Coming Up. And um, so I think it's, what is it, one in 36 now in 2018? What's the projections? Do you know? What are the projections? You know, you had Stephanie Seneff on your show. She said one in two by 2050. I mean, you know, pr projecting is nothing more than extrapolating the direction of numbers going. And so what I what I think is safe to say is that it's only getting worse. And and since we seem to be adding vaccines to the schedule, and as you know, in California, making vaccines mandatory. And since I think vaccines are the primary trigger for autism, it would stand to reason that that rate is likely to go up, not down with time, unless we do something you know, radical and drastic. And so that's, you know, it's a, it's just an incredible problem. I mean, I'm, you, you, I think you said you were born in 1975. So I was mm -hmm. born in 1969. So we're, we're, 
you know, more or less the same generation, Mm -hmm. which means we both know that we didn't know children with autism when we were growing up. We didn't know children with anaphylactic food allergies. Um, We didn't have schools where 25% of the kids were in special education. And I think that, um, you know, one of the points I try to make in my book, autism is just like this tiny little tip of the iceberg for the the level of chronic illness that today's children are experiencing. Mm -hmm. Um, The autoimmunity connection to um, vaccines is unequivocal. There's even a textbook vaccines and autoimmunity (laughs) right like from wiley and blackwell it's like on amazon you can buy it um and and like if something is that accepted in the mainstream and most parents don't know it that's pretty disturbing but um you know a kid who has a learning disability who um has an anaphylactic food allergy and my son i would argue are suffering from the same injury yeah there's the book (laughs) <laughs> right? That's a, that's a textbook. A textbook. That's a textbook. That's crazy. Um, it, yeah. And so, like, when you walk into your pediatrician's office, why don't they say, hey, here's the six vaccines we're going to give you? Um, by the way, just for fun, Google UCLA, UCLA DTP asthma. I'm just curious what the first thing that comes up will be. Yeah, I'll do that. UCLA, UCLA, UCLA DTP and asthma. Um, it was a 2000 study. It, it should come up as the first thing. Um, I know it's online. Um, the reason I'm, the reason I'm bringing up asthma is asthma is obviously a form of autoimmunity. Um, and it can be a very debilitating condition. Right. Um, and yet, uh, you know, when you go into, uh, yeah, it's the second one Hit that second one right here. Okay. Diphtheria. Yeah. This one. Yeah. So, um, you know, what's the conclusion? DTP or tetanus vaccination appears to increase the risk of allergies and related respiratory symptoms in children and adolescents. Um, so, and, and they, they say towards the end of the study, like on the last page, they're like, you know, if, if it weren't for DTP vaccine, uh, don't quote me, it'd be like, we'd have half as many asthma cases or something, you know, it's like, it's like, you have to be kidding me that, um, yeah, one or more components may be responsible. Oh, there it is. Um, because the proportion of U.S. children who've received at least one dose of DTP vaccine approaches 100%, um, that number of allergy and allergy-related conditions attributable to DPP or tetanus may be very high. Wow. Jeez, <laughs> right? You see that on You know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's you nuts. Know, this, is, this is, you know, so, for example, assuming that the estimated vaccination effect is unbiased, 50% of diagnosed asthma cases, 2.93 million children, would be prevented if the DTP or tetanus vaccination was not administered. That's why okay, like this is in 2000, right? This yep. is UCLA mm-hmm. doctor. I, you know, I just, I, I read these things and I just, I, I sometimes like, I'm like, God, I'm, I wrote my book. I'm out of here. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know how to help people who won't help themselves. Mm-hmm. And, my point is like, if you happen to be, I don't know what the odds are that a pediatrician actually watches your show. I don't mean to insult you, but I know how close minded most of them are. No, I don't think like many. If yeah. If you're a pediatrician and you're watching this show, shouldn't you tell parents before you give them a deep TP shot that it's correlated to asthma and that they might want to do a risk reward on a lifetime of asthma versus diphtheria as right. an example. Yeah. Just right? a, I mean, a simple question, right? Maybe, why would that be rational? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you another one that um, if you Google Gallagher and Goodman, so, you know, Gallagher and Goodman hepatitis B, um, we have these scientists out of SUNY Stonybrook. And, um, you know, I personally think, and this is much more of intuition than it is provable, I think that hep B may be the doozy um, of all really? the vaccines, like the massive neurological injury. Really? Yeah, so good. Gallagher, yeah. So click the third link, the third link, because you'll get the whole study. Um, okay, interesting. Yeah. So, right. So I think this is the they did two of them, and this is the one where um, they just they checked. Okay, if you got the whole, if you're a boy, and you got the whole round of Hep B, how many of you ended up in special education? And go down just a little bit, because I can I can't. Um, hang on. This study found uh, during the time period. Oh no! This was this, this might be the one where they actually showed like three times more autism. So they uh, they have two studies. Okay. They have two studies where they just look at Hep B. So they basically take a group of boys who got Hep B and a group of boys who didn't, 
and they just say what's the autism rate and what's the um, special education rate. Uh -huh. And, you know, again, don't quote me. I'm not carrying all these things around perfectly in my head. But, like, the autism rate is triple and, like, the special ed rate is, like, seven or nine times as many. Wow. Right? Like, this is, this is really disturbing stuff. And yet these kinds of studies are just swept under the rug like they never even existed. Um, this is SUNY Stony Brook. Um, and, and yeah, I personally think because because Hep B was introduced in like the early 90s. Uh -huh. And that's when we really see the rates take off because it's given super early. It's still given in certain communities on day one of life, which is you know, kind of so madness. That's so crazy, right? It's so crazy, it's so crazy. especially, I mean, Hep, Hep B is one, you know, I kind of go through every vaccine in my book. Hep B is one that I can say with conviction. I think it's insane that we give that to every child. Oh yeah. Um, I think a baby whose mother has Hep B should actually get the shot. Like I actually believe that you should give that vaccine to a child whose mother has Hep B. But we screen for that, right? Mm -hmm. We screen for that, so we actually know who those children are, mm -hmm. and um, they're, they're, they make up a tiny, tiny percentage of babies. Mm -hmm. and, and here we have pretty compelling evidence that. Special ed rates and autism rates and Hep B are highly correlated. It should be a giant red flag. And then um, just to build on Hep B, because I think it's such an interesting one, um, on my blog, on JB Hanley blog, one of my more recent articles um, looks at a study done out of China, and it, it's like truly a first. Um, it, it's interesting. The Chinese government is funding studies looking at vaccines in animals, right? Like the American government would never do that. The Chinese <laughs> no. government, that's what kind of goes to the top of my blog. Like you laugh, right? But you, you shouldn't have to laugh. You know what I mean? You shouldn't. There it is. The, one of the big brain. The one of the big brain. Go down just a little. Yeah, right there. July 2nd. Okay. Right? So so um, what I talk about here, you can go down, and I'm sure it'll link to the um, to the actual study pretty quickly. So click on brand new study. Um, just so people can see, like, these studies really do. Okay. So this is a um, – it, this is from China. Look at where this guy is. So, so – you know, Sun Yat-sen University in the People's Republic of China is one of the like top five universities in the entire country. Wow. Um, Jin Bin Yao, Jin Bin Yao, who's the lead author, he's listed last, mm -hmm. um, is a University of Pittsburgh educated scientist. Interesting. And um, you know, this this basically spells out exactly what we know about how vaccines cause autism. And in this case, um, they look at uh, they they inject aluminum, they inject the Hep B vaccine. And they inject a placebo, and they want to see what the impact is on the brain, mm -hmm. right? So they give them the they give them the vaccine, they wait, and then they look at the brain. And what they find is all these really high levels of cytokines, particularly in the hepatitis B mice. Okay, like dramatically different from the saline placebo mice, mm -hmm. right? And so the very thing that we're all saying about the way Hep B seems to be causing neurological damage, they're showing through mice studies. And just to kind of give you a nuance, it's actually really important for people who are more science minded. Um, one of the things that comes out of this study specifically is that um, there's a time gap between when the vaccine is administered and when the neurological conditions manifest in the mice. Okay. Now, mice, you know, their developmental period is much shorter than a human's. But if you extrapolate from it, which is easy to do, what you can say is that there's a latency period, a latency period between when the, when the vaccine is injected and when the neurological condition manifests. And if you think about the fact that the hepatitis B vaccine specifically was safety monitored for five days when they did the trial on babies with Hep B, five days for safety monitoring, uh -huh. any latent neurological development. And this is one of the problems with vaccines. When you get a vaccine injection, if your arm fell off, we would all know that the vaccines cause that. But if they cause... Um, if they cause like a learning disability four years later, we have almost no way to draw a, a line between those two things. Yeah, but exactly. now we know because of public biological science that there is in fact a latency period between when it's injected and when the neurological damage manifests. We don't know why exactly, but we just know that it is. And that's one of the things that that study proved. And again, an honest scientist, I really believe that that study that I talk about there that that Jin Bin Yao and his colleagues did, um, you know, mm -hmm. within calendar year 2018, mm -hmm. an honest person at the FDA would raise a red flag and say, we need to go back and look at whether Hep B is okay for babies' brains, right? That's what 
that's what would happen with kind of any other consumer product if a study like that was published. Right. And like, it would be recalled, you know, right? I mean, it would be recalled yeah, eventually. Like, like, uh, yeah. You know, let's just, let's use a natural product for fun. Let's say that stevia, let's say stevia was shown to cause the kind of brain damage in mice that the hep B vaccine just caused. Uh, you could can you imagine? Assured, <laughs> you can rest assured that there would be a nationwide recall of stevia. And yet these, these studies are hiding in plain sight by, you know, funded by the Chinese government. Um, and they're in China where pharma doesn't kind of control every movement of every person. Right. The reason they're taking a hard look is because their children are getting autism, right? They've adopted Western vaccine schedules and now they have a massive autism problem. And to the Chinese government's credit, they want to know why. Uh-huh. And, right. and I, I say this, I say this with sadness because I am a proud American. Um, <clears throat> I think autism will be solved on a foreign shore. I think that our um, our our American scientists are way too scared. Uh, they can't find funding, first of all, unless no. parents are willing to get them. Mm-hmm. But if they publish, if they published a study like like the Chinese just did, they'd be excommunicated from whatever university setting they were in. Mm-hmm. They're scared to death to touch this topic, and so luckily, there's people in foreign countries who aren't scared to death. And it might well be the Chinese. You know, we, we spent all this time talking about how China's like this horrible violator of human rights and all this stuff, right? Right, well, right. Well, guess what? Guess what? When it comes to censorship on this issue, the U.S. is so much worse than the Chinese. Oh, man. I know. And, right. and the Chinese might be the ones to help solve the autism epidemic. Mm-hmm. I would bet money well before the U.S. does. And so, you know, again, if you're a science-minded person, then I hope you'll go read that article that I wrote. Read it critically. Think about read the study itself critically. And, and hopefully at that point, you'll be like, oh my God, he's totally right. This is staring us right in the face, the damage this vaccine is doing, no doubt to the brain of an infant. And yet there is not a peep about that study at the FDA or the CDC. There That's, should be, but there is. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, it's it's all just money and, and pharmaceutical ties to, you know, the government. And it's just, everybody knows that. And so, you know, that's a lot of sense. So I would encourage everyone to go out and get this book. You guys can probably see it, How to End the Autism Epidemic by J.B. Hanley. This is an awesome, awesome book. Um, a lot more we could have covered. We could have gone so down so many more roads and um, different topics and things like that. But JB, I know you got a busy schedule. I know you have to leave. So, man, I appreciate your work and I appreciate everything you're doing. Thanks so much for being on. I really appreciate it. Man, thanks for having me. I, I'm I'm grateful and I'm happy to come back at a different time. So thank you very much. Awesome. All right, JB, thank you again. And um, I'll be in touch via email with the link to the show and uh, keep up the good work, man. Cool. Okay. Take care. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. Wow. Man, oh man, oh man. What did you guys think? Um, it's cool. I really enjoy the, let me take these out of my ears because they're, I don't know why. I just don't like these things in my ears for too long. But man, I feel like this after show is is where it's really fun for me to interact with you guys and to, um, and to see what you guys thought about the show. So what did you guys think about JB Hanley? Did you enjoy uh, his show, his his um, thing. It was it was kind of challenging to get a lot of questions in because I don't think he could hear me as well. Um, I think that we forgot to ask him to put a uh, an earbud in. But in any event, um, our you know the goal of our show is to give you guys resources and to allow for you guys to look further into other people's work that like they would never have this guy on the mainstream media. I know that he was on the doctors, but you know the that doctor show. I tell you, I, I'm not. I'm not on board with that show at all because there's so much psychological manipulation and um, pharmaceutical ties to their advertising and all of this crazy stuff going on with that show. Um, you know, the doctors are up on the stage wearing a white coat as if they're somehow better than we are and they know more than we do and they know how our bodies work because they're in a white lab coat. And, you know, the ties to, like like JB was just saying, in any other, with any other product, you would have a total recall, you know, like spinach a couple years ago. Remember back in 2015, spinach was like, oh, uh, you know, like there's some E. coli or something and spinach just got recalled. And it was this big like nationwide sort of deal. Um, and then, you know, it's just if it's a natural product, if it's an herb or if it's a imagine an herb doing this to someone. And like he was saying during the show, like and, and what and what 
instance in, in history has there ever been an accusation of a product causing harm where the person who was putting out the product, those who profited from it, actually were held liable and were found to be guilty? That never happens. You know, what profit does it have for, like, for example, like, for a, an army of mothers to say that their children now have autism as a result of these vaccines like what are they going to get out of it other than trying to help the population so that these vaccines don't give other kids autism it's not like they're profiting from you know making their voice known and they're profiting from you know uh, speaking out about what caused their child their child's autism they're not making any money off of this thing and so I just find it so fascinating that you know we're so willing to protect the people that make a profit, and that's just our culture. That's just the way our culture is. You know, it's nuts. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed this show. This was a, a sort of a kind of an impromptu show on a Thursday, which we don't normally do. Um, Paulette is here, and she she says women with autism, everything is about boys. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. There's some sort of connection between the hormonal factor of boys and testosterone and how that interacts with the, um, the heavy metals and the adjuvants and things in, 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 um, in the different vaccines. And so here's an interesting take on vaccines too, um, and flu shots and things like that, um, from one of our, our friend of our shows, Dr. Richard Massey. And he was saying recently that, so, when you have a childhood illness, so we had a while back, let me think about this. We had, who was his name? Dr. Thomas Cowan on the show, and he wrote a book about autism and vaccines and things. And what he was saying was, he wasn't really talking about, if you haven't heard that show, make sure to go listen to it, because it's really good. But he was saying, he's not, he, he, he didn't come on to sort of argue why vaccines cause autism. That wasn't his point. His point was to show a direct connection between someone who is not allowed to go through a childhood illness and cancer rates and heart disease rates and Alzheimer's rates and all the chronic degenerative diseases that happen to us later on in life, there's a direct connection between not being able to go through something like chickenpox and measles and mumps and rubella and all of these things because it has to do with the, um, the cell-mediated arm of the immune system. And so that's different from the body's... Um, innate response, which is creating white blood cells. This, the, this is the other arm of the immune system, the cell mediated response. And so he was showing a direct correlation between if we get these flu shots and vaccines and all these things that sort of prevent us from going through these childhood illnesses, then the incidence of cancer and other degenerative diseases later on in life just skyrockets. And so that was an interesting take on the vaccine thing because it's he was sort of skirting away from not skirting away, but the focus of his work wasn't there to show that like vaccines cause autism. It was more, how does this affect one of the arms of the immune system and how does that impact life later on? And so I thought that was interesting. And another interesting take, which was, I was just going to share with you from our friend, Dr. Richard Massey, who's a former medical doctor. This is an anesthesiologist, right? So he was saying, tying in a connection between, this is sort of more esoteric and kind of woo-woo, but it gets into the work of recall healing and Dr. Gilbert Renaud and all of this stuff. And so what he was saying was when a child, let me see if I can word this correctly in the way that he so eloquently did it. But when you have the option as a child of, or not the option, but the event of going through a particular disease, not disease, like childhood illness, like chicken pox or mumps, mumps or rubella, right? when you are prevented from going through that, those diseases from a spiritual, emotional perspective have to do with freedom from your parents. Um, and when you prevent a child from going through that, then you prevent like a stage. It's sort of like a stage where, um, you know, Jewish people will, will have their bar mitzvahs and in the, in, in, in this, ceremonial passage of, in life from one stage of life to another. When you prevent a child from going through that, um, the child's only response is to make it so that he continually has to be reliant and dependent on the, mo on the mother, which is an autistic state. So I thought that was really interesting. And so there's a lot going on here, a lot, a lot going on here. So interesting takes on all of these things. I'm curious what you guys think. Uh, Kadash culture is here. 
Um, Patriot CD is here. I was damaged by the Hep B. Pretty sure the reason I've got bad sight in my left eye is a result of the Bill Clinton vaccines. Wow. Bad eyesight in your left eye. Well, whatever you're doing, make sure to protect your eyes from blue light, uh, Patriot CD, from um, by wearing these orange glasses. These these help um, tremendously with your nervous system and your um, DHA that gets created in your eye and your nervous system. Um, make sure to protect your eyes at the very least. Um, vaccines are a depopulation weapon. Interesting, interesting. I've heard that before, right? I mean, you go you go and you look at. You go and you look at what is our good friend Bill, Bill Gates talking about. I love the way they word things too. They they really try to like one presents like overpopulation as a problem that must be solved. And one way to solve a problem, and you look like the hero when you can solve a problem, is through um, vaccines. So, like, what is he talking about there? If you look up on YouTube, Bill Gates. Uh, depopulation vaccines, you'll find it. And it's a sort of a keynote speech he was giving, I forget to whom, probably about four or five years ago. And he was just talking about, you know, one way to solve the problem of overpopulation is through um, proper vaccine schedules. And it's like, okay, it sounds all like, it sounds just kind of, the way he words it is so innocuous, you know? But what he's saying is exactly what Patriot CD. Now, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's his agenda. I don't know Bill Gates personally. So, um, you know, coming out and saying that is, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I know what, it's like that famous quote. You can only know your own experience and everything else is programming. So everything else that you're being told by some other human being is programming whether that's coming from a pastor, whether that's coming from a spiritual leader, whether that's coming from J.B. Hanley, whether that's coming from me, everything else is programming if it's not your own experience. Um, and so you could ask, you know, the logical sort of philosophical question, well, how do I know that to be true? Because that is itself, that statement is a pro programming statement, right? So um, interesting topic. So Patriot CD says iris on my on my laptop. Awesome. Good, good, good. I'm glad you have the iris program blocking. Blocking blue light. Kadash Culture says, yes, SBO pro probiotics should be part of supplements. Orange tint on my phone. Good job, man. Good, good job. I do that too. You can probably see, I was telling JB before the show, you can probably see I don't have a, um, I don't have a, a phone. I use this primarily for um, the show. And so I film videos on this, but you can probably see, can you see that? Um, yeah, so you can probably see, let's see. Yeah. You can probably see that there. If you guys are watching on, this is a orange screen I have, and you can do three taps of this and it turns it to blue and you probably can't even see that. Right. So got to block blue light in any way you possibly can and turn off all of your four wireless antennas that are on your phone. And um, if you watch the show that we did recently with, oh gosh, Zirin, X-I-R-E-N on Lyme disease, and he talked about EMF and what, what's going on with your phones. And so when you go into your phone, you have four antennas that you wanna make sure you turn all the way off, aside from just the blue light thing. So this, this, this whole thing now is, um, this whole thing that we're living in, this world that we're living in is incredibly toxic and it's becoming more and more toxic. And like I said during that commercial, uh, the biggest environmental impact, I think, um, that's happened in our culture since the invention in the late 1800s, 1879 roughly, of electricity is this 5G network that we're moving towards. Um, I'm looking at articles and Verizon is now sending me emails about what's what's to come about what how amazing 5g is and this stuff is really really damaging guys and that's why it's one of the reasons why i did that spot for the green wave filter earlier because you know 5g doesn't have anything to do with dirty electricity um actually it kind of does i was listening to professor martin paul Are you guys familiar with him uh recently and he was saying now check this out this is like this is so crazy this is like this is the, the thing it's like like what JB was saying on the show, like we're not looking at all the different studies. JB was on, if you if you type in JB on the doctors, he says this exact thing years ago. And he was saying that like, we don't study all the different aspects of, of what's in these ingredients and what's in these formulations of vaccines. And not only do we not study all the different 
individual ingredients, but we don't study how they interact with each other. So within one vaccine, you might have you know 15 or 20 different ingredients or even just more than one, even if you have two. But if you're taking now 15 shots, now that 15 times two, now you have 30 different ingredients at the least, right? So how do all those ingredients work with each other? And have there been any long-term studies showing the interaction between those things? And the answer is we don't know, right? We're just sort of testing on our own population, right? So we don't know what these things are doing. And so in the same way, we don't know that. With regards to 5G, I was listening to Martin Paul, and he was saying this fascinating thing about 5G wireless technology. And he was saying that, first of all, this is probably something you all know, is that there has to be a lot of towers because we're going to be doing self-driving cars. We're going to be hooking up basically the internet of everything, right? So in order to facilitate this massive amount of data draw from the 5G, we have to have a lot of towers because there's so much demand on it from the data that we're going to be using, downloading Netflix videos, that kind of stuff, right? So, um, but what he was saying was, we have this dirty electricity in our walls, right? And that's kind of like what I was talking about before uh, with Brian Hoyer coming out to our house and doing some testing and showing massive amounts of dirty electricity in the wall. So we have that that's already... A, there. And if you were to look like, remember those things that you used to have in the eighties, I remember it was on Ferris Bueller's day off where you put your hand on that globe and the, all the little like frequencies would come off of it on the, the glass ball and, and it would go towards your hand. Well, that's kind of what happens according to Martin Paul with 5g and dirty electricity. So we have this electrified house that we live in, right? That's causing all kinds of health issues. If you want to go do some research, look into the work of Dr. Jack Cruz, Magda Havis, um, gosh, it goes on and on and on. Um, so we have this electrified house and these walls that are have electrical fields and magnetic fields coming out of them that we can't see. Then you have dirty elect or then you have the 5G networks, right? So what he was saying was that this frequencies actually jump on to the frequency that's in the dirty electricity that's in your walls. So this is the population, this is the environment that we're living in. What are we going to do about that, right? Um, there's a, there was a huge town hall meeting where we live here in Southern California with Verizon and this cell tower that they put right next to our neighborhood. And if you look at this thing, uh, I, I don't know if I have any pictures of it on Instagram, but th this thing looks like one of those towers from, uh, what's that, what's that movie called? Um, with Katniss Everdeen. Um, I forget the name of the movie. But you know, it's uh, it, it looks like a like a police state. This thing looming over our neighborhood, right? And you know, Verizon had a uh, a whole town hall meeting there, and they set everything up. So this is this is what they did. They set everything up so that there wasn't like one speaker and people on a microphone asking the speaker questions. They separated everybody out on different tables. So in order to make it so that if someone was objecting, no one else could hear because there's all these different conversations and tables going on. And I thought that was genius by Verizon's part, right? To do that so that people don't wake up to this kind of stuff. But it's it's the biggest environmental change I think going. And I think if you really wanna focus on your health and get healthier, what we have to do is like I have in our store, light, water, and magnetism. You gotta get your light environment fixed. You have to fix the amount of blue light you're being exposed to. And there's lots of different ways to do that. If you go in our store, we've done shows. You can watch videos about it. Um, but there's software that you can get called Iris. That's in our store. It's like 15 bucks. Um, you got to get these blue blocking glasses. Uh, you got to be wearing those all day long if you're exposed to fake light, blue light at, in the daytime. So you got to fix your light piece. And then on, on top of mitigating and, and blocking all the light stuff, you got to go out into the sun and get the good biophotons and over 1500 frequencies that live in the sun, right? So this is what fuels our mitochondria is light. So we got to get the light environment fixed first. This is all before food. Like food is like way down on the list. So light, water, what's your water like? Are you drinking healthy water? Are you drinking acid, um, acid water? Are you drinking filtered water? Is your water just from the tap? We got to make sure that we fix our water environment. Uh, and, you know, water becomes our blood in 30 minutes. 
and water is what we're made out of. Water is what allows our body to carry that electrical charge that we get from the environment, from, from the magnetism of the earth. We're electrical beings, and water is what powers the battery. And so if you don't have the proper kind of water in your system, you're not going to be able to carry that electrical charge that keeps us all alive. So light, water, magnetism, like I was sharing before about the, the magnetico mattress pad, the magnetic field of the earth has been decreasing for the last 4,000 years, over 80%. So we are, magnetism is, is what keeps the electrons in our body alive. We are magnetic beings. Um, and, you know, if someone has a heart issue, you know, you get the defibrillator out, that's magnetism, right? So it's really important to light water magnetism, start bringing more mag magnetism into your life. This all comes before food. And then I think the fourth piece of getting healthy is your EMF environment, because talk about a tremendous stress on your body um, from EMF and dirty electricity. And you know, I was I was saying before the show, before we started with JB, uh, of what uh, what's her name, Stephanie Seneff was saying on our show, and she was saying she was saying it's basically called it the unholy trinity of autism, and her take was pretty interesting. And that is that there's a, a connection between glyphosates, vaccines, obviously, and dirty electricity and EMF coming from non-native sources, basically anything electrical. And so this unholy trinity combined with each other, um, you get the vaccines and then the dirty electricity happens and it affects your cells and affects your biology. And then you start consuming glyphosate and it just throws everything off. And she says that, that, that three is what's causing autism. I don't know. I don't think a lot of people know, to be honest. Um, you know, that was really good, uh, sh show that we did with her. Um, you know, Jennifer says hunger games. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, man, that, that tower that looms over our neighborhood is like hunger games. It's like we live in, you know, district six. Um, and it's just, these things are happening everywhere. So the answer, like I was talking with Brian Hoyer um, when he came over to our home to do the EMF assessment, you know, there's one there's one answer, and that is to go live in the middle of the woods. But then there's no telling what could happen at that point, right? Because if you go out in the middle of the woods, you know, what if Verizon wants to set up a cell tower right where you are, right? What can you do about it? Um, or you can just invest fully on mitigation strategies. And there's all kinds of mitigation strategies. He was saying to me that he's working on, I think he's building a home. I think um, I think Brian's out in Cincinnati. I think he's in, in Ohio. And I think he's building a home that's gonna be completely mitigated 100% from EMF. So it's gonna be the type of thing where everything's hardwired. There's no stray voltage. There's no dirty electricity. There's no Wi-Fi hitting his house. There's no 5G towers that can get in. It's basically a Faraday cage inside of his house where everything's grounded. And all the electricity, like if you're using a blender, all the electricity is contained within the blender and then back into the grid. And so you're not exposed to anything. The problem with that is that it costs a lot of money. He just sent us. So for him to come do the assessment, it was like, Gosh, I think he charges like 1200 bucks for that. And then you have, you find out where all your problem areas are, and then you can connect those to your health issues, right? You know, he's text, uh, uh, testing geopathic stress and all kinds of stuff. And then you have to buy all the products to mitigate yourself. But in my opinion, if you're living in a home that you want to be a forever home, then this should be at the top of the list. Before you buy a blender, before you buy any of the products on our store, before you do anything, you should start working on mitigating your house from EMF. Um, but all that to say, when I brought this up to JB Hanley, the three-headed monster of what's causing autism, he was saying it makes sense, but there's no science to support uh, the connection between um, EMF and autism. Um, so I don't know. I mean, maybe he's right. I, I don't know. But, um, you know, he's, he seems intuitively to think there's some kind of connection. But at least from an empirical, logical, scientific perspective, um, there's no evidence showing that, at least yet. Um, there may be. So Patriot CD says women's eggs, especially during fetal development in the womb, are 10 times more sensitive than the rest of the tissues. 5G is going to be disease X guaranteed. Wi-Fi 5G is an infertility weapon. Interesting. 
Yeah, it would make it would make sense. I mean, I, how many of you guys in the chat room right now are know of someone or are having problems yourself getting pregnant? Um, it's a huge, huge issue. It's a huge, huge issue. Um, I can tell you what though, if I were someone who worked for, it's hard to even put yourself in that position, right? But I was gonna say, like, if I was someone who was so, so, you know, with such low dopamine levels, and I was someone who was so a part of the system, I would probably think like they think, right? You have enough people to where you want to be able to be a parasite and to extract money and profit and control from them. But you don't want too big of a population because if you have too big of a population, then you, you know, the fear of being overthrown is there sort of looming. So you want to keep people in this kind of this little balance. Like it kind of reminds me of those uh, Georgia Guidestones, you know, where they have this population that they want to hit. Um, but, you know, at the same time, they're making money all off of us. So there's this delicate balance that they, they, would, they probably want to keep in terms of population control. So it makes sense. Latin says, Latin Wiccan. I like that name. I've been detoxing metals with chlorella, spirulina, cilantro, kale. Good. I'm glad. Heavy metals is another huge issue. Who are we going to have on the show about talking about heavy metals? We're going to get a, an expert on talking about how to deal with this. I forget the guy's name. I was just listening to him recently. I listen to a lot of stuff, guys. I'm trying to bring some stuff to the table for you guys. You're an animal is here. I know you're an animal. You have some EMF issues yourself. Funger hames. Um, don't forget, we need proper, healthy, high levels of cholesterol for sunlight to do its work in our bodies efficiently. Yeah, yeah, totally. And the sun helps with cholesterol on the skin because um, our skin is our event horizon. So we want to make sure that that surface level is optimized to receive as much sunlight as possible. Um, it's basically our solar panel and the sort of analogy goes, if you and I were to buy a tree, an apple tree, and we both plant it in the ground next to each other, and um, we take time, we put soil in, organic soil, we're putting rock dust in, we're putting ocean-grown diluted minerals in, we're putting all this stuff onto the soil, um, and we do the same thing, and then I throw a tarp over that, and you do not, what's going to happen to the one with a tarp, right? So, in the same way, our skin is our solar panel, and we need to figure out ways of getting more light onto our solar panel, which is our skin. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. One of them comes from, first of all, cleaning your skin and getting the toxins and chemicals off your skin, and then consuming substances that allow you to hold on to more light. I can get into those later. Um, and then bringing more light into your life. Like we have that juve machine, which is a red light machine. Uh, we go out in the sun as much as we possibly can. Uh, there are different things that you can wear, like different clothing from like cool tan or kiniki that allows, I think, 80% of sunlight to come through and to penetrate their materials. So um, is there an issue with, uh, you know, ovarian cancers or breast cancers or prostate cancers? Uh, is there a connection between our inability to get light to those places and those cancers? It's interesting that recently one of our guests was mentioning, oh, it was Nathan Walls, that it's possible, new evidence is now showing that your body can actually produce melatonin locally. So we always thought that melatonin was something that gets created um, at night when we go to bed, but it's actually created in the eye from the sun. Um, specifically in the morning sun. So when we expose our, our eyeballs directly to that morning sunlight, right when it rises out of the horizon, that's when we create melatonin and set off our hormone levels through our pituitary gland uh, and set up the actual circadian rhythm for the day um, so your body knows when to be tired. This all happens in the morning in the sun. So that's why it's so important. But um, what he was saying is, Nathan Walls, that is, is that it's possible for you to create melatonin locally in the skin. So melatonin is sort of talked about as like the sleep hormone. And I think it's on purpose because it's not just the sleep hormone. As far as my understanding goes, there's over 4,000 different uh, biological processes, um, enzymatic processes that it, that it impacts. And it's the number one anti-cancer hormone, melatonin. So 
the fact that you can create it locally on the skin shows me that we should be getting our breasts in the sun. We should be getting our prostate in the sun. We should be getting our, um, our family jewels in the sun. We should be getting all these exposure exposed to the sun every single day. Um, and so is it on purpose? You guys are a little bit more conspiratorial minded here in the chat room today. It looks like, is it, on purpose that they've sort of highlighted the fact that melatonin is simply the sleep hormone and not the, no, the number one anti-cancer hormone. Is that by design? I don't know. I tell you what though, these people are smart and it wouldn't put it, I wouldn't put it past them to do that because if they're trying to control the media, then they're controlling the narrative. And if they're controlling the narrative, then they're controlling emotions. If they're controlling emotions, they can start putting doubt in your mind like JB was talking about in this episode, putting doubt in people's mind. All you have to do is just a little bit of doubt. It's like when you go to, if you're shopping around for cars and you're, you have your mind sort of made up on two cars and then you go to one place and that guy puts doubt in the other person's car in your mind, that's all it takes, and that doubt that doubt starts to ruminate. It's like fear. So when that doubt starts to ruminate or fear starts to ruminate, then you're easily controlled. And so would it make sense that they would actually try to control the narrative and not highlight the fact that melatonin is one of the most anti-cancer hormones in your body that your body actually creates and just talk about it as a sleep hormone? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if they would do that, but... Why not if you're them and you know that, right? I mean, why not? If you want to control the population, like the Rockefeller said, right? Own nothing, control everything. Um, and so that's really what it's about. It's about control. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you guys are ch ch chit-chatting away here in the chat room. This is cool. I love I love hanging out with you guys. And uh, yeah, talking. Okay, so Zenab, is that how you say your name? Z-E-I-N-A-B. Nicholas Penault is a lead speaker on EMF. He offers courses on how to recognize symptoms from EMF and what to do about it. Yeah, we've had Nicholas on the show. He's a cool guy. He's got the EMF prescription, I think. Um, Patriot CD, you always have interesting things to say here, my friend. You've been, wa wa been watching a lot of conspiracy videos on YouTube. <laughs> I love conspiracy stuff. It's, I just find it so interesting. Most of the earth is uninhabited. Elites and MSM program is saying that the earth is overpopulated. Not true at all. They also say cow farts cause climate change. You know, it's interesting you bring, bring this up, Patriot, because I've often thought about this. Because a lot of times what people say is that in my lifetime, I think when I was a kid, like I said, I was born in 75. So in 85, I was 10. Uh, you know, 10, 12, 15 years old, I remember the population of the earth being around, I think it was like 5 billion. And then when I was in my early 20s, I'm 42 now, uh, it was around 6 billion. And in and, and 20 years, it's gone from 6 or probably 15 years, it's gone from 6.6 .6 billion to 7.7 .7 billion, last I checked. So that's 1.7 billion new people on the earth. I don't know. How are they figuring those numbers out? You know? Um, What's the MSM program? I know MSM is being like a substance, a sulfur-based substance that you can take that's good for your health. Um, but yeah, so I've often wondered that, you know, how are they actually populating, you know, telling us what the population is? Because there'd be no way, there's no conceivable way for any of us to actually re refute their numbers, right? You're an animal says some data from deagle.com shows America being depopulated down to 99 million by 2025. Interesting. With Deagle, D-E-A-G-E-L.com. Never heard of that one before. Down to 99 million. What's the population they say of the earth, of the America? I think it's 325 million from what I heard recently. So if you're, if you're the government and you want to depopulate the earth and make people sick, or if, you're the, if you want to depopulate America and make people sick, let's just think about this out loud and what their plans and agenda would be. What would you do? If you came right out and actually just killed people, <laughs> that's not, you know, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. It's too obvious. You know, they have to have this illusion of this dog and pony show that they're, you know, this benevolent group of people that want to help us live better lives, right? That's the, the illusion um, in all of these elections and things. So the other option, if you're not going to come out and just depopulate right away, then the other option is do it slowly over time. 
by use of control and by use of environmental factors that people uh, can't really seem to get their mind around. And so there's going to be all these people debating whether or not chemtrails are bad or vaccines are bad. Meanwhile, kids are being diagnosed every day with autism and people are dying from these things. And so that would make a, you know the most sense, right? And so then you're if, if you're thinking from one of their perspectives, then you have to sort of manage how many people you kill, right? You can't kill everyone. You got to just keep it slow, but you got to make it so that the people you do leave alive are going to be people that you can easily control and manipulate. And then the people that are killed, you're making money off them during the time that they're going through some kind of illness, right? And that's exactly what's happening. That's exactly what's happening. Now, whether or not that's actually true is a whole separate thing, right? What we can say is that, at least from my perspective, if I were an elite, um, this is probably how I would think, right? So, and it looks like that's what's going on in the culture. So now that that's going on in the culture and there's a connection between all this, is this what's actually happening? That there's no way to prove. I mean, unless you want to be, you know, a member, a secret member of the Bilderberg group and go out and try to figure out what's going on, you know, but so, but really does it matter? That's the real question. Does any of this really matter? You know? Um, Okay. So you see here how to end the autism epidemic, right? JB Hanley's book. Awesome book. Let's say vaccines cause autism. Let's just say they do. And it's like mercury fillings. Now now dentists are are starting to move away from the mercury fillings, a.k.a. the silver fillings, which they tried to hijack um, that label and call it something else. Okay, so let's say that now they retract that and they readily admit that autism is caused by vaccines. Now what are we going to do? First of all, that would never happen because that, I mean, look at the, um, the, the dental industry, like they're just now pulling back on mercury fillings and they're not even doing it publicly. It wasn't like, oh, sorry, we're causing mercury damage and, you know, Alzheimer's and dementia. Where's the public apology for that? Right. All these people coming down with all these diseases as a result of mercury toxicity, from their fillings and there's not one word spoken. And, you know, it's just a a silent sort of behind the scenes. We're going to move towards ceramic and porcelain fillings. We're not going to work with mercury anymore. Right. That's just kind of what, what it, that's kind of what's happening, you know? So the real crux of all this stuff, and this is something that we talk about. Um, Hey, Rebecca, awesome to have you here. She's, uh, she's a part of the extreme health Academy. Awesome. Awesome to see you. Um, So the real crux of all this stuff is that, in our modern culture, we live in the world of ideas. Uh, we live in we live trapped in the mind and in the in the brain, and we never go into the body. That's why we're so disconnected as a people from our feelings and our emotions, and that's why we stuff things because stuffing an emotion is a logical thought. It's not something that you would do if you were living in your body, right? So, because of that. We like to talk about and hover in the world of ideas because that's good for the ego, right? If we live in the world of ideas, then it's fun to have little debates about things. Do vaccines cause autism? Is there a connection between mercury fillings and dementia and Alzheimer's rates? Um, Does glyphosate cause leaky gut and autoimmune diseases, right? We live in the world of ideas. And when we do that, we can continue to debate each other and, and continue feeling like we're separate from one another. And this is a very egoic kind of uh, situation that we have if we do this, right? Because it feeds our ego. But what really is the solution is what are we going to do with that information in our own life, right? So it's very egoic for me to debate someone about vaccines causing autisms, right? And then I could, I could be right and I could push this guy down. I could show him the evidence. I could do all these things. And I won that debate and blah, blah, blah. Right. But at the end of the day, what does that even do? Even if it, you know, convinces the entire population, they saw my side of the argument and they thought I won the debate. What does that do? It doesn't do anything. And this is the issue because the ego wants to separate itself from, from what's actually happening in the world. And so 
by talking in the realm of ideas, we continue to kick the can down the road, not offering any solutions to the world by bettering ourselves. So what does all this mean? This means that we all have to go do some spiritual, emotional work if we want to really affect change in the planet. If we really want to affect change and help other people, then we actually have to start showing some self-love and some self-care. Uh, and the ego doesn't want to do that. You know, It's not easy to change your diet and get rid of all sugar. It's not easy to do a colon cleanse or a, a liver cleanse or a coffee enema or, or stand up to your parents if they think your kids should get... Um, uh, you know, vaccines. It's not easy to do these things, right? But this is the spiritual, emotional work, uh, physical, spiritual, emotional that we have to do if we really want to make this world a better place. So living in the world of ideas gets us nowhere because it, what good is it if every person in America knows that there's this thing called the Bilderberg Group and the Illuminati and they're controlling us? What good does that do? It doesn't do any good to all just know that. We have to do something with that knowledge, right? And so this is where being healthy comes in, because if you're not healthy, if you don't have the energy and the um, the hormones, the testosterone to really feel motivated and to go after something and to make something happen, this all comes from having healthy hormone levels, healthy testosterone levels in men and women. And so if you don't have the energy and the, and the ability to do that because you're all gummed up and not feeling good, then it doesn't do anything for the population. So that's why we really need to start investing and focusing on our own self-care if we really want to affect change in the world. Look into Senomix. How do you say that? Senomix uses aborted fetal tissue as an ingredient in natural and artificial flavor. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Go with a holistic or biological dentist. Um, yeah, you know, a couple substances that you can take uh, with regards to the 5G are the carbon-60, um, which is the incredibly small molecule of carbon. And we did a whole show with Bob Greska on this. And um, and what this does is a free radical scavenger, and it helps to donate electrons to, uh, to, to your bodies. And it's all about electrons. Um, Dr. Thomas Levy was saying uh, recently in a talk that he gave that the cause of all disease is a, a depletion of electrons in the body and he was just getting into the biophysics of it because really that's what it all comes down to electrons and protons and neutrons that's really where health is won and lost um, and this is why light water magnetism are always going to be the the pillars of health right not food because food turns into electrons you know the electron train chain transport on your mitochondria is electron chain transport it transports electrons not um, fats and lipids and carbohydrates. It's electrons. And so this is why carbon-60 is so important, as well as molecular hydrogen. Um, Brian Hoyer was saying that um, he was quoting, oh gosh, Dr. Mercola in some studies that were saying that molecular hydrogen is an incredible substance for helping to mitigate EMF. And this is why we have that product in our store from Vital Reaction. So these things are mitigation strategies, my friends. I'm the only 19-year-old I know that has any interest in these subjects. It's really sad. More people need to swallow the red pill. Yeah, it's interesting, too, that, um, that the red pill, blue pill idea from the Matrix, you know, um, that's cool that you are, you're 19 and you get all this stuff. But just make sure that you allow people the grace to have their own journey. Um, this is something that I, when I first learned about health and I started learning about this stuff, dude, I have to tell you, when I was l reading the book Fit for Life back in, nine, gosh, when was it? 2003, I think? Yeah, 2003. I realized like, wow, people can heal from catastrophic diseases like cancer naturally without taking chemo? What the heck are people taking chemotherapy for? What the heck? Why would they ever do that? Don't people, don't doctors know this? Why don't doctors tell people this, right? And so I went into this whole thing and then I realized, okay, doctors, chemotherapy, drugs, the medical industry, the Rockefellers, all this stuff is inter intricately connected, right? So they're never going to tell people about this. So then I thought, okay, light went on in my head. This is my job. I got to go tell everyone to, to start taking care of your health and you can mitigate all of these diseases naturally. The problem with that is that you're giving your power away when you want other people to look at the world the way you look at the world. If everyone saw the world the same, it would suck because then there would be no difference of beliefs. In the Bible, it talks about iron sharpening iron. 
And we all have different experiences, different life journeys, different paths, different events that have happened to us, different perspectives and exposed to different information. And when we get to be around other like-minded people with different perspectives on things, um, that allows our mind to grow and to expand and to see things in a different way. Um, and so that's what perspective is all about. But the problem is that we were all given the right from our friends and family to, to go off and go do our journey and to get a perspective that we want, right? That's something that we were able to do with freedom. And then when we start gain, gaining a different kind of perspective, then we want to take that perspective and go be an evangelist like, you know, in the Christian church and the Mormon church and go force people to see the world the way we want them to see it. And when you do that, you prevent people from having their own spiritual, emotional journey. So the way I've sort of come to over the years is letting people know that you have a different perspective, mentioning it casually uh, in conversation, but never beating other, you know, people over the head with it, just letting people know and being completely okay with whatever they're doing, whatever they're saying. If someone is saying something that is triggering you, like fire on here saying that distilled water is the only kind of water that you should drink. You should only be a vegan. You should only be a paleo person. You sh all of you should be f fasting every day. If I said things that triggered you, then that shows us that there is a, there's a connection between who we are and who we think we are. And we need to break that connection. It's almost like we should start referring to ourselves in the third person. Because once we realize that there's no connection there and that we are not our bodies, we're not our, our opinions, we're not our thoughts, we're not our experiences, we're not any of those things, we're much more than that, then it starts becoming something where we can actually make some ground and make some headway in our spiritual life, our emotional, physical health, and everything else. And so not beating people over the head with your perspective is has been key for me. I'm not telling I'm not saying that's what you should do because we all get to, you know, if I did that, I'd be doing the same thing you would want to do with your friends uh, to get them to see the world the way you want them to see it. For me, this has been a huge for me to allow everyone to have their own journey. So you want to hear a real world example of how this is playing out in my own life. This is kind of personal, but I'll share it with you. Um, it's not it's kind of personal in a sense but not really. If you've been listening to our show for a while, you you know. But the reason why I got into doing this show is because my mom was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1995. You guys probably all know that. So at that time, we knew nothing, right? I was, what, 20 years old, 1995? Knew nothing about any of this stuff. And when I watched her go through that, I watched her go through hell. She literally walked through the fires of hell. And seeing her go through that just broke my heart. Uh, and I thought to myself, this can't be a, you know, chemotherapy can't be the answer here. This is nuts. Like my mom would get up off the couch and she'd walk to the kitchen, which is like 20 feet away. And she could, she'd have to stop. She'd have to stop what she's doing because she's out of breath and dizzy. Lost all of her hair, aged like 15 years in a matter of eight months. Had a bone marrow transplant, chemotherapy, multiple rounds of chemotherapy for months in the hospital at the City of Hope in one of those little bubble things where you couldn't even go touch her. Uh, radiation, surgery, all stem cell transplants, all of that stuff, right? That's how I got involved in all of this. Eight years later, and so I had the seed in my mind that something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was. And then eight years later, a friend of mine gave me a book of... Um, fit for life. And that's when I, the world started opening up. Then I got exposed to David Wolf, heard him on coast to coast. And then I joined his, uh, you know, the best day ever Academy and just took the ball running from there. And my whole world just completely opened up like in ways that you would never imagine with regards to so many different subject matters, free energy, spirituality, uh, politics, religion, all of this stuff, just completely, I'm still on this path of, discovery and self-exploration, right? So that's sort of what happened. Um, and then fast forward for a lot of years, my mom has had, her body has had an extra bit of cells. I'm not going to call it cancer anymore. I'm tired of calling it cancer. Her body has had an extra growth of cells, at least according to some testing that they did a number of years ago in her lungs. She was a longtime smoker. So we went through that scare and she went and got uh, she has two lobes of her lungs removed, right? So it's just nuts, right? 
Was she going to make it through the surgery? Was she going to live after that? How was she going to be able to breathe? What's going to happen? So then she makes it through that. And then just probably about six weeks ago, or no, maybe a couple months ago, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so you want to know how all of this is tying back to the spiritual growth that I was sort of talking about is that there's a lot of fear in people. And I get it. Back when I was 20 years old, if this had happened to my mom and I, and I had known what I know now, aside from the spiritual growth aspect of this stuff, I would have been all over my mom telling her, sending her articles about this, that, and the other, putting all this fear in her life, um, telling her that she can't do chemotherapy, chemotherapy kills people, blah, blah, blah. I would have been just all over it because I thought it was my mission when I finally first woke up to tell people about all of this stuff, right? Um but what I'm learning now is that from a generation, generational perspective, if you listen to the shows we've done with Recall Healing, with Dr. Gilbert Renaud and um, Dr. Richard Massey, that from a family constellation therapy perspective, a younger generation doesn't get to tell the older generation what to do or how to live their life. That's for the older generation to live. The younger generation, that's why it's always said to... Um, honor your father and mother and bless those that came after you. We put our blessing on our children and we honor our mother and father. And so my mom knows about all the stuff that we do. She's listened to David Wolf. I went to her with her to LA multiple times to listen to David Wolf give talks. She knows about all this stuff, right? Um, but she's very scared. And for me to continually to browbeat her, the best thing for her to do She's getting chemotherapy right now for her breast cancer or for breast cells in her. I should say it like this. She's, she's getting chemotherapy for cells that are, that, that are perceived to be in her breast that they think are cancer. That's the best way of describing because that's really what's going on. The best thing for me to do is to support her in her journey. And that's the best thing that you can do with family and friends. I'm sure you guys, you're an animal patriot. Um, all of you guys that are in the chat room right now, you guys probably know know of or have been touched directly or indirectly by people that have had cancer, because it's one in two now being diagnosed after the age of or after the year 1960. It used to be one in three women, and one in two men. Now it's one in two if you're born after the after 1960. So now, what am I going to do with my mom? She's already made up her mind. I actually even paid for her to have a consultation with a breast cancer, a medical doctor, breast cancer uh, doctor who's now sort of woken up and seen the light, Dr. Christine Horner. She's down in San Diego, and we had a, a meeting with her, and um, she put my mom on a whole protocol of things to do. So she works with people who have these, these cells in their breast, and what she does is she specifically works with people based on what they want. So if they want to do 100% natural, she'll work with them there. If they want to do chemotherapy, but they want to do other things to mitigate that, she works with people there. And so my mom, I knew, already had her mind made up with regards to chemotherapy. So I chose Christine Horner because she's been on our show and you know we really support her work. She's in our archives if you want to listen to the show we did with her. Um, but... The reason why I spoke with her is because, with my mom is because she's a, a medical doctor, but also works with people who have chemotherapy. And she has tremendous stories of people going through chemo, just sailing through it, not even losing their hair. So this is like crazy stuff, right? Not everyone doesn't lose their hair, but she's had many, many people that have never lost their hair by going on the protocols that she uh, shares. And I'm doing a video about this in our Extreme Health Academy, and uh, and that's going to be available soon once we uh, publish that. But um, all the different strategies that she talked about is, is, are in this video, and that's going to be in the Academy pretty soon. And so anyway, she told my mom, she said, sorry, this is all going back to the spiritual side of how health affects us, right? So she tells my mom, okay, you have one or one of two decisions here. You can either tell your oncologist what you're going to be doing, or you can just don't say anything. Um, and she said, I would recommend not telling your oncologist because they're going to convince you to get off these substances that can help you fly through chemotherapy. Okay. So because of the fact that we've been so conditioned and so programmed in our culture, 
I'm not blaming my mom for this, but she went and told her oncologist of all the different substances that she wants to take during the chemotherapy. And what do you think the oncologist's response was? It was, don't do these things. There are no scientific studies showing the efficacy of these things with relation to your cancer. Again, he said it was your cancer, and it's not her cancer. All of these things are, are it's a whole, whole separate subject, but these things that we have in our life aren't ours. We download them into our nervous system. So, and then he said, I wouldn't want these things to interfere with the effectiveness of the chemotherapy. Can you believe that? So I don't blame my mom for this. She, she did what the doctor told and, and, and she's not going, she's not doing any of the things that Dr. Christine Horner mentioned. And so now in light of everything we've been talking about after this show, how do we respond to people like this? Right? This is my mom and my mom and I are good friends. The whole reason I'm doing this radio show we've done, this is 630 shows. It's because of her and her story. I felt like I had to get the word out that there's other options. I'm not advocating any other options. I'm not advocating that you do anything. Just want to let everyone know they're there. And perhaps we've been sold a bill of goods about the effectiveness of things that are in our mainstream media, like chemotherapy, like radiation, like vaccines, like flu shots, like, uh, you know, what dental amalgam, mercury amalgam, fill, uh, you know, fillings. So the whole reason why I'm doing this show is a way of honoring her and her story. So when she chose to not do any of these things, what's our response to that? So this is the whole thing. Do we give up our own power to try to make other people see the world the way we see it or allow people and honor them in their journey? Um, I think it would be remiss for us to not share some of our truth with people and let them know that um, if they scratch a little bit more, there's an itch there and there's more information there. And so to let people know that we have some things that might be able to help them. And if they ever want our information, they know where to get it and they know what we stand for, but we're not trying to alter or change their journey. And so the biggest and best thing that I can do right now is to support my mom going through this. And it's so hard to see her go through this. I'm telling you guys, like you guys, you know, like this is all happening behind the scenes here. And I'm sure you guys have people in your family and your, in your friends and family that are dealing with cancer and dude, it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, and so loving her, honoring her and telling her that she's going to get through this. Everything is fine. You're doing great. Staying positive and believing in the treatment that you, that you've chosen is where I've come to on a spiritual path. Because reading books like, um, gosh, Lissa Rankin has a book. What is it called? I forget the name of it. But she goes into the to the placebo effect. There's and, and then there's also the book by Dr. Joe Dispenza, You Are the Placebo, and understanding that placebo is up to sometimes 30% of the recovery. Um, and just believing in the treatment that you're doing is the best thing you could ever do, whether you're doing chemotherapy or you're doing... Um, all natural, the high, high dose vitamin C therapies and 714X and, you know, Halen 951 and doing all these anti-cancer, you know, things, the belief in it, I think trumps all of that. And so allowing other people to have the journey has been so massive for me. It's been such, it's been a whole process of letting go, complete letting go, complete abandon and complete surrender and honoring those that are in my life that chose to do things a certain way and not judging them for that. Because once we start judging people and trying to persuade other people to think the way we think, that's when we, we start going down the path of becoming more sick than they are. And it's a bad, it's a bad road to go down. So just let everyone have their journey. Let everyone do their thing. Support everyone and just be happy, supportive, uplifting, and a source of inspiration for them. And then if they want more information, then you're there for them. Um, they know where to get it, right? So Jennifer Jennifer says, breast cancer awareness is owned by Big Pharma. Pharma, go figure. Yeah, you know who has a pretty good video about this is Chris Work. He has a little rant he did in his car a few years ago about breast cancer awareness month and Susan G. Komen and all that. All that, the story behind that is just fascinating. Um, 
The baby should be born in the home as a water birth, no drugs, and it immediately begins sucking and clipping of the umbilical cord until it's done pumping. You know what? Um, yeah, that's uh, that. That's idealistic, and it's true, but it's idealistic. There's a whole birth story that just happened with our kids, um, and you guys know me. We are the most natural hippie sort of alternative health people in the world, and we had to. Um, I guess you could say we chose the path of having a C-section. I say we chose it because on a subconscious level, we chose it. It was part of our life journey to have that. Perhaps as a sacred contract, like what Carolyn Mace talks about in her book. Consciously, we didn't want a C-section because we understand. You listen to the show, listen to the show that we did with um, Doc, uh, Janice Barcello. And she gets into Satanism and blood and what they do in hospitals. Trust me, we know about all that stuff. So consciously, a C-section was not what we wanted. Um, but there's a whole story behind that too that I think is causing me, at least in my life, to constantly let go of idealistic platitudes, generalized platitudes that saying one thing is better than another. And then I'm confronted with a situation where I have to um, take on the very thing that I stand against. And then that thing becomes a beautiful experience for me. It's crazy. So the more, the more you take a position, the more you karmically create a counter position. So the more you stand against something, it's like um, what, uh, what's her name? Uh, Mother Teresa said, you know, I'm not going to march against war. You know, I'm going to be, if you want me to march for anything, I'll be happy to join a pro peace march, right? I'm not against something, I'm for something. The more we take a position on anything in our life, the more we karmically create a counter position. And so the more of these things do, we, like in a karmic way, the more obstacles and roadblocks and challenges that we create for ourselves. And so it becomes a real, like, you know, years ago, my wife's dad mentioned to me before I started the show, are you sure there's going to be enough to talk about with health? You, you, really? There's there's enough people that, that want to talk? And I think maybe he thought we we're going to talk about the food pyramid or fats, carbohydrates, and proteins and things. But man, when you get into all of this stuff and the spiritual emotional side is one, one piece of it, but man, like the personal development, the growth, the, the, all of that. And then you have the, you know, the way health ties into governments and environment and politics and spirituality and life on this planet, man, it just goes on and on and on. And what's amazing about that is that it allows for us to continually grow, which is so cool and to continually get new perspectives. Um, if you get a C-section, get a towel and rub the birth canal and get the bacteria and wipe it all over the child, inoculate them with bacteria. Yeah. You know what? That's, uh, that's, challenging to do. Um, ideally that's, that's great, but it's challenging to do when you're in a hospital, uh, whose, whose room is controlled by the hospital. And as a result of that time is money. So it's down to the second when you're getting a C-section, um, and convincing a doctor to allow you to do that is really challenging. If you were to have a C-section at home, you could do that, but it, you know, that begs the question you wouldn't, if you were at home, you wouldn't be having a C-section. Um, you know, so there have been some doctors that question whether or not the vaginal mucosa lining has enough bacteria to be able to translate to the child. Um, I disagree with them on that, but I agree with what, with what you're saying here. Um, yeah, a lot of cool people. The system is rigged against alternative ways to treat cancer. Insurances won't cover them. That's what pushes people to conventional treatments. Gonza 75. That's true. Have you guys ever, so this is like interesting. If you guys ever have any friends or family that are older uh, and they say to you, oh, I would love to go get this scan or go get, um, you know, like maybe their medical doctor also does IV vitamin C therapy or something like that, right? Um, and then their insurance changes. And then you hear them say, I would love to go get an IV vitamin C, but my um, insurance no longer covers it. Or I'd love to go to that doctor, but you know, that doctor is no longer covered under, under my insurance. I hear, I hear this kind of stuff all the time. And I'm here to tell you that, and me and all of us, that we have the power to go wherever the hell we want to go 
when it comes to our bodies and our health. So if you are not wanting to or not able to go get an IV vitamin C from a medical doctor because that medical doctor is no longer part of your insurance plan, this is where it becomes hypercritical to become creative and put our creative caps on so that we can say, okay, how can I do that? It's like that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, where the poor dad would always say, we can't afford this, that, or the other. The rich dad would say, uh, okay, we don't have the money for that now, but how can we create the money for that? How can we, that instantly puts your mind in a creative situation, which has been purposefully, I think, taken out of us, is to get into that upper state of your mind that's, that's highly creative and to access that. That's the dream world. That's why we tell kids to snap out of it, stop daydreaming, right? That's that part of the mind that we need to get into to become creative so that we can come up with solutions for not just ourselves getting the vitamin C, but for humanity and and our fellow humans. So accessing that creative part of your mind. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't get a, a certain treatment because it's not covered by your insurance. You know, go get a different insurance. Figure out a way to make some extra money to go pay for that. You know, when it comes to this kind of stuff, I'm not going to let any doctor, any insurance company tell me ever what I can or can't do. Because if I have to pay for it out of pocket, if if an IV vitamin C is, let's say it's $150, but if, if it's out of pocket, if it's $3,000 and I really want to get one, I'll figure out a way to get one. It's just what has to happen, Right. I'll put, I'll do a GoFundMe campaign. I'll ask my friends and family if they can donate. I'll figure out how to start a little business on the side. I'll take some extra hours at work. I'll do whatever it takes to, to get the food or the procedures, whatever else um, is necessary for, for me. Um, wow, have a thought about it that way before taking a position on something and then this creates karmic challenges for us. Yes, that confirms what keeps happening in my life. You know, it's the age-old issue, uh, Zinab. I read a book called, um, what is it called? I'm blanking on books today. It was all about this years ago. The Seed of the Soul by Gary Zukoff. I read this in 2001. I took a trip around the world, and I saved up for about a year and a half, um, and I saved up all my money, and I went surfing and I've traveled all around the world to expose myself to other cultures and to other perspectives, exactly all the things I've been talking about and other ways of looking at life. And so I feel like this was part of my hero's journey that Joseph Campbell talks about in his book, A Man with a Thousand Faces. Um, And so I felt like this was part of my journey in life and my life path is to take a year by myself and travel around the world. Um, I was all set to do it in November. Then all of a sudden, 9-11 happened, right? 9-11 happened, and so then I really had to make a decision. Do I go or do I live in fear, which is what the government wants me to do? So I went, and it was the best thing I ever did. Um, And on that trip, I read the book, The Seed of the Soul by Gary Zukov. It didn't resonate with me. For some reason, I couldn't get into it. I remember I was in Rotorua, New Zealand, uh, in a hostel all by myself on a Friday night reading that book, and I just wasn't into it. Couldn't get into it. Then, gosh, maybe a year and a half ago, I picked it up again. And the perspective of 15 years of experience and personal growth shifted. And now that book is one of the most influential and life-changing books I've ever read. Um, And he talks about that. Taking positions on anything, whether it's vaccines and this, you know, how to end the autism with with J.B. Hanley or that my diet is better than yours or my God is better than yours. Taking positions on things creates counter counter positions. And so everything has to be in balance. So when you start taking position, Trump is good, Trump is bad, uh, the government is good, the government is bad, uh, the government's trying to kill us, um, Susan G. Komen is bad, breast cancer is bad, all these things, when you start taking positions on these things, a counter position has to be created on some sort of spiritual, emotional, karmic level that has to balance those things out. So that's why some of the greatest people say, do not be for or against anything. That way you absolve yourself 
completely of this attachment to your ideas because we have this weird idea in our in our world that we are our opinions we are our thoughts we are our ideas we are our experiences we are our bodies we're none of those things and so when we think that we are those things that's when we have this this attachment so when people say things that trigger you it shows that we're attached to those things that we think we are but we're not and so that's why it's i think it's really important to at least in my life it's been for me to try not to be for against anything and this kind of essentially makes you like a, a rather boring person you know because if you're not going to be if everyone's railing on and on about trump and they think he's horrible or they think he's the gre greatest thing since sliced bread you know if you don't have a position then you know you're kind of seen as being boring or uneducated or whatever but at the end of the day those people who love trump or those people who hate trump in 20 years from now all of that energy that's inside of their bodies that's being generated that electrical charge all of that stuff has to go somewhere and 20 years from now where did all that go did it help support and sustain their life that or was it a stressful energy and it caused cells to mutate i don't know all this stuff is connected right so that's why i mean even the 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 statement to not be for or against anything is itself a statement it's a position right So at some point it becomes a really strange thing, right? You can't really say anything about anything if you're not, if you're not going to have a position. But in general, it's a way to lower our stress. It's definitely a way to lower our stress. So anyway, I don't know why. I, you know, this, this, this week has been very strange. If you guys follow our show, our Monday show, there's an issue with – I, I, there's a communication issue with Dr. Brian Mole. He was going to be on talking about diabetes, and somehow we just misfired in the communication, so it wasn't meant to happen. Then on Wednesday, we had, uh, what's his name, Wayne Blakely, and he was going to be on the show, but he doesn't want to be on video um, for lots of the same things that we're talking about today with regards to, I don't know what. Um, I don't even want to talk about that, but he didn't want to be on video. And so I was trying to figure out ways to do a live show and not have him on video. It just didn't, didn't work. And so maybe I've just had this stuff building up in my in my consciousness for the past week or so. Um, all this stuff to share because it's funny because for me I, I listen to so much stuff. Like I sit in my sauna every day. I watch documentaries in there at one point five speed, so I'm blowing through through documentaries, learning all kinds of new stuff. I do the same thing when I'm jumping up and down on my rebounder. Um, you can probably see me on Instagram doing that. Um, and I, I'm just blowing through content, listening to health podcasts, listening to uh, spiritual, emotional podcasts, listening to personal growth and business and all this stuff. Because I think it's really important to be completely um, well-rounded um, and, and be well-versed in what's going on. So I love learning new stuff. And so maybe that's why I have so much to say. I mean, this show is the, the after show here has been longer than the actual show itself. Um, so, so I appreciate it. I'm glad you guys are enjoying the show and you love what we're doing. Um, make sure to subscribe Patriot and Jennifer. Um, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I think there's like a little bell somewhere down on there so that you can get a notification when we go live, but I see you guys a lot. So you probably already, already are notified, notified. Jennifer says, thank you, Justin. Your words of wisdom are helping me so much today. And the energy this week is interesting to say the least the energy this week. I wonder, yeah. Well, I'm glad my words have helped you. I appreciate that a lot. That's why we do what we do. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Very brave of you to stand by and respect your mom's decision. Yeah, man. I mean, this is like, this is this is really challenging. This is where like a lot of the stuff that we talk about on our show that you guys listen to and I listen to. I mean, I'm just here as a host at, at, trying to ask questions that make some kind of sense. But we hear all this stuff about things. Like we had a show... Um, gosh, what was it with Mary Toko and her daughter, April Renee Hunter, I think her name is. Those were episodes four and episodes 34. So that would have been back in 2012. And I think it was Mary Toko who said on our show, it might have been her, that vaccines cause cancer. There's unequivocal, un unequivocal <laughs> uh, evidence showing that vaccines cause cancer. So 
we hear these things, right? And so if they are, then, you know, what do we do with a, with an, a real world example of our friends or family? Like uh, just the other day, Kate's parents, uh, you know, we were talking to them and, or, or Kate was talking to them and she was telling me about it. And she said, oh, what do you guys do? I said, oh, we just went out and got our flu shot. You know, this is a real world example, right? These are my parents-in-law. So, you know, I'm I'm right there with you. I live in the real world just like you guys do. And it is insane. Many of you guys know that, you know, I was coming down with kind of a, a throat issue a couple of weeks ago, back on August, October 27th. And I went out and got an IV vitamin C um, therapy, um, high dose vitamin C, along with some other nutrients in there that I had them whip up for me uh, intravenously. And I essentially knocked out what would have been I think a nasty, nasty issue with my throat. Um, I think I still have some issues with pharyngitis that I used to get years and years ago in my late teens. Um, and I felt that coming on again. And so, you know, you could either get a flu shot or you could get something like that. Um, you know, Dr. Massey was telling me just recently that, you know, he was saying that a lot of people think that if you don't vaccinate your kids, you are putting them at risk and you're not you know, being responsible parents, right? But there are things that we can do. We can do homeopathic vaccines, right? In his case, he's never seen a scenario where someone, a child, has come down with mumps, measles, rubella, chicken pox, the flu, stuff like that, where ultraviolet blood irradiation, UBI, hasn't completely and 100% fixed the situation. So now that you have something like this at your beck and call, and in your consciousness, you can say, okay, well, now I've got MMS, I've got turpentine, I've got all kinds of things I can use. UBI, ultraviolet blood irradiation therapy, that's basically where they take your blood out and they expose it to, I think, um, ultraviolet light, right? And then um, they reintroduce it back into your body and your blood carries those photons of light back into the body and actually kills um, bacteria, fungus, mold, and things like that. And he has said that he's never seen a case where that hasn't worked for someone. So it's interesting, right? So, I mean, it's good to have, you know, options and choices and know what's out there. Because if you don't know what's out there, then you're going to be easily controlled through fear. Um, <laughs> Simply Me Laura says, where did you go to get that? I've done... Do you mean the... IV vitamin C, it's at a place called Spark Health in Carlsbad, California, in Southern California, Spark Health. <laughs> Gary Zukoff is amazing, and I'm ordering his book. The book, See the Soul, is a game changer for Oprah, too. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, See the Soul. It's funny when these things hit your consciousness, because when I first read that, I wasn't ready for it. I don't think I was ready for the information in the book. Um, back when I was, what, 25? I uh, wasn't quite ready for it. Uh, reread it and man, talk about a life changing book. The Seed of the Soul by Gary Zukoff. Um, if you guys go through our Amazon link on our homepage, Extreme Health Radio, that would support the work that we do. Um, if you ever want to buy on Amazon, consider going to extremehealthradio.com and then there's a link at the very bottom uh, for Amazon. Um, try water fasting. It is fantastic for our body, though be careful and under a doctor's supervision should cure almost anything. Watch documentaries. Yeah, I've, I've watched a lot of stuff on, on water fasting. And um, there's a guy I know who I followed his 30-day water fast. He actually did 45 days, I think. Uh, Steve Pavlina. He's a personal development um, writer uh, at stevepavlina.com and um, does a lot of cool stuff. I really like the work he's doing. And he's done a whole thing on water fasting. And we've done some shows on it. We did some shows on intermittent fasting. Um, fasting really is the, the cure-all for everything. Um, you know, giving your body the chance to actually re, uh, heal and reju reju rejuvenate. Uh, Triana says, the U.S. has so many vaccines. I live in Ireland. We don't have half as many. My brother lives in San Diego with two kids, and he's never seen a child with chicken pox over there. We don't vax for this. Yeah, so you, Triana, you're in, are you Irish and you're living in Ireland? And your brother's Irish and living in San Diego? Is that the idea? Wow, amazing. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I mean, you look at the vaccine schedule. I mean, look at this. If you guys are watching the screen, if you guys are coming in late, I don't know if you saw this this uh, this thing on the back of J.B. Hanley's book, but look at the look at the curve here. Let me see if I can do that. Look at that. Can you see that? 
So that is the, let me get a little bit closer. That's the autism rates from 1970 all the way up till today. Um, in 1970, it was one in 10,000. In 2018, it's one in 36. So you can't tell me vaccines aren't at least a part of what's actually happening here. Wow, Triana, you're in Ireland. Wow, it must be like around midnight there or 11 o'clock, 10, 11 o'clock. That's awesome. Big fan of Bono and you too <laughs> coming out of Ireland. Uh, that's awesome. Never been there. Never been there. I'd love to go to, I think it's Scotland, right? To see the um, Stonehenge. Um, watch some interesting documentaries though about the, ro the royal family though. That'll pretty shocking. Um, if you guys are er, if you guys are ever interested in the va in the um, documentaries I watch while sitting in my sauna, uh, most of them are not health related. And um, should I share it with you? I, I keep a place online where I watch all of them, and uh, they're a lot focused on spirituality, personal development, conspiracy theory, stuff like that. Um, if you go, should I share with you where I keep them all? There's probably of hundreds of them. Um, by now, um, that every time I watch a good one, I put it on there. And, um, so let me know if you guys want me to share that. If you guys are interested in the same kind of stuff, if you're listening to this, you you probably are. Um, does anyone know if MMS or high dose vitamin C works better for lung infections? Can't do both. MMS. If you've never done MMS, Christine, it is really powerful really, really powerful. I did it years ago, but I think there's better ways of doing that. I did a whole show on lungs. Christina, if you want to go to our YouTube channel to, and go to the videos and just scroll through and look, and I did a show about lungs, um, all kinds of things that you can do for your lungs, including MMS and vitamin C, um, all kinds of things that you've probably never even heard of as well, like the lung cleanse and, um, radionics and things like that to help with your lungs. Um, th this would be good for anyone who also has uh, some extra cells in their lungs too. So if you scroll through our YouTube channel, you can see it was a podcast too. I didn't do it on video, but it was just an audio podcast. And I should give you a ton of things on there that you can do um, for your lungs. What about quantum physics? What you put out comes back. So if we put, if we put out all the good, you would think good comes back and vice versa. Yeah, that's the only way to live is putting out good energy and good information out and letting good come back to you and attracting that. Um, you're an animal says is responding to uh, Triana from Ireland, whose whose brother's living in San Diego and was lucky enough as a child to get intentionally exposed to chicken pox. Yeah, I did the same thing. 72 doses. What did you say? You guys are chatting up a storm. I love it. 72 doses of 17 vaccines, I believe, on the CD skit. Okay, so 72 doses of 17 vaccines on the CDC schedule. So at the very least, what what is the cause of this? What is, you know, what's the cause? What's the reason behind it, do you think? The reason behind it is, is in my mind, it's got to be one of two things. It's either depopulation and getting people sick or making money. And it doesn't seem to me if you're a Rockefeller, or if you're a Rothschild, you would squawk at either of those two things. You probably want more of both of those two things. So watch out for healthy adults 2020 mandatory vaccines for adults. Yeah, that's the next, I think that represents about 70% of the market share potential for pharmaceutical companies. Uh, is getting people on board with adult vaccines. And you're seeing it now more and more in the news where people have to get vaccinated for certain jobs. Um, now they're going to start tying it. I think Stephanie Seneff was saying people are going to start tying it to uh, travel and birth certificates as well as driver's licenses. So what do we do? What do we do? The royals are inbred. Inbred's part of the Nephilim bloodline. <laughs> Uh, you've watched your fair share. You're pretty. You're pretty awake for 19. That's uh, that's hilarious and awesome. Um, yeah, I just got some private messages here from from someone and a couple other people too, wanting to know about the uh, where I watch the documentaries. If you go to justinstelman.com, J-U-S-T-I-N-S-T-E-L-L-M-A-N, that's my personal website. Um, I wanted to write 
more spiritual, emotional, sort of personal development type articles there because I like that and I love that. And I started that website and I keep all my documentaries I watch under the, the more tab. And so if you guys are looking for really awesome documentaries and YouTube videos, um, I put my whole f playlist together there for you. All right, Zinab says you subscribe. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, let's see. What else you guys are chit-chatting about? Okay. Patriot has to go. Cool. Well, phone's about to die. Well, this has been about two hours, 20 minutes, guys. I think it's time for me to go. Um, let me just tell you guys about our upcoming show on Monday. Or I'm, I'm sorry, tomorrow we have Angel Huerten. We're going to be talking with her about her her story of overcoming stage four uterine cancer naturally. That's going to be awesome. 1045 tomorrow. Uh, Monday, Dr. Len Saputo about light, clinical applications of light and medical practice today. That's going to be a good show. Uh, and then on Monday, it's going to be a double header at 1045, Dr. Bob DeMaria, the drugless doctor. And we're going to be talking with him about all kinds of cool subjects. So that's going to be, if you have health questions or anything like that, make sure to join both those shows. Um, and again, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for patroning our store. Um, I didn't even do spots for these um, these these two things here. This is the, uh, the Magnetico. Um, not the Magnetico. This is the actual rapid release. Um, guys, look into this thing. Please watch the videos. Go here and watch the one with Terry Bradshaw and what this thing can do. Um, I, I'm not going to do a whole spot for it now, but I just want to let you guys know it's there and it's an option. It's something to have in your home um, for injuries, for anything. Um, I use it over my liver. I use it over my brain. I use it over my whole face. It's it's amazing device. Um, that's the rapid release technology. And then the Bellicon. Um, guys, whatever you're doing, invest in a Bellicon. Get one of these things. Um, jump up and down every single day. Um, it's incredible for your lymphatic system and cleansing and building your body. It's one of the best exercises I think that there is. Um, there's no other exercise that even comes close to this. Um, every exercise is different and has different effects on the body. Um, but you can see a picture of, of me on our Instagram uh, jumping up and down on it here. That's a one of Coco. But yeah, get a Bellicon, guys. Bring these into your home and start rebounding, jumping up and down on a rebounder. I can't tell you how much this has impacted my life. So anyway, thank you guys for your support. You're amazing. I love you guys so much, and we appreciate every single one of you. Christina, Patriot, you're an animal. Triana from Ireland, YouTube fan, me too. Uh, let's see, Zenab, so many people here. Um, Nikki, Limes, Rebecca from the Academy. Um, so love you guys so much. You're amazing. This was episode 631. So go to extremehealthradio.com as soon as it's published, which might be a little bit of time, but I'll put all the show links to all the different articles that JB Hanley talked about at extremehealthradio.com slash 631. We love you very, very much. And I'll see you tomorrow at 1045 AM Pacific time. And until then, have a great day and a great evening. And I'll talk to you then. No material on this blog is intended to suggest that you should not seek professional medical care. Always work with qualified medical professionals, even if you educate yourself in the field of live food, nutrition, and alternative medicine. I'm not a doctor, nor am I offering readers medical advice of any kind. None of the information offered here should be interpreted as a diagnosis of any disease, nor an attempt to treat or prevent any disease or condition. While information in this blog is discussed in the context of numerous conditions, it can be dangerous to take action based on any information in this blog or to start any health program without first consulting a health professional. The content found here is for informational purposes only and is in no way intended as medical advice, as a substitute for medical counseling, or as a treatment slash cure for any disease or health condition, and nor should it be continued as such. Always work with a qualified healthcare professional before making any changes to your diet, prescription drug use, lifestyle, or exercise activities. This information is provided as is, and the reader slash viewer assumes all risks from the use, non-use, or misuse.